Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees regular meeting called today, warned today for one o'clock on Thursday, July 18th. This meeting is being conducted through a Zoom uh, teleconference procedure. It is also being shared publicly with uh, via a live stream on YouTube. Our Zoom license allows up to 500 people to join us in that way. And so I extend a warm summer greeting to everyone. Um, we have a long agenda today. I would note for trustees that we are following a revised agenda that was posted to our website earlier today and sent to us more recently um, by, by Todd. And uh, we have great confidence that we will be able to get through this agenda and that we will be able to complete it in a timely fashion. Before I begin the formal meeting, I'd like to make a statement and share it with every one of you. I'd like to acknowledge that as we're sitting here today, a new chapter is being written across our nation and across our state. Writing that chapter is more important than any item on our agenda today. Aliens from another planet might describe we humans as a rather clever species, but my how they like to look down on one another. It happens everywhere. Yankee fans frown on the faithful Red Sox followers. Trump loyalists have a hard time understanding Obama devotees. White collars lord it over blue collars. And sophisticates snub bumpkins. It goes on and on. But from where I sit, and I know I don't sit alone in this, conflicts among people of different faith traditions and discord between white people and people of color are the worst examples of our propensity to look down on one another and to hold people down, keeping them down in economic, social, and even physical ways. Racism especially mean-spirited racism and the false supremacy of white privilege have been woven into our American lives from the earliest days. Not uniquely American by any means, but nonetheless deeply American and troublesomely American. I saw it and in retrospect shamefully tolerated it during the late 1950s and early 60s, when I was growing up in deeply divided and deeply troubled Washington, D.C. Racism and privilege were normalized at the dinner table by my parents, bitterly and aggressively by my father, but more softly and gently by my mother. Tolerance in my family growing up meant that we had to be polite to our all white neighbors who didn't have Anglo-Saxon last names. And we certainly weren't permitted to go into their homes, but at least on the street, we had to be nice to them. There were 1200 guys in my first high school and you could turn page after page of our yearbook without seeing anyone other than my white classmates. The kids who didn't look like us they went to the decrepit public schools like the infamous Eastern High in Washington, DC. Later when my family moved to, Ver to Vermont while I was still in high school, I learned that you didn't need to live among people of color to see racial bias. It was here too. During my senior year at St. Mike's, I did my final project in social sciences on the Irisburg affair. And Mimi and I took a drive up to the Northeast Kingdom to see firsthand what Vermont-style, mean-spirited white supremacy 
and privilege look like and racism. Personally, I'd like to think that I've gotten beyond my early growing up experiences. Heck, Mimi and I have raised a multiracial family. But my personal efforts to be and to behave the way I want to be, well, it's not unlike my achy back. I can go for a long time being careful, sensitive to my back, then pop, out it goes, and the ache that was lingering there all along came back. The formative perspectives that we learn in childhood are equally resilient and durable. It has proven to be my lifelong challenge to lock down those unfortunate experiences of 60 plus years ago and not to allow them to affect my views today. The Vermont State Colleges inevitably harbors some degree of white privilegism and racism. It's undeniable, but its inevitability and undeniability cannot translate into our resignation. We can't shrug our shoulders and say, it's always been here. We can't do anything that will make it go away. As trustees, I believe we are duty bound to look at it squarely. Yes, racial bias is here, tenaciously and durably here. And it is wholly contrary to everything that we are about as leaders, scholars, and learners. As trustees, I believe it is up to us to help lead that way, to look each member of our VSC community eye to eye, stand with them shoulder to shoulder, walk with them stride by stride, commit to temper out our use, or to temper our use of second person language Second person language is those students, those faculty, those staff. We need to embrace and broaden our use of first person language, our students, our faculty, our staff. No longer can we say, well, I think they do pretty well here. Rather, we know we can all do well here. Within our VSC communities are individuals, small groups, micro communities, if you will, of people of color. They are all too often disappointed and chagrined by the presence of racism in our system. There are times when they are hurting and there are times when they are worried. It would be naive of us to think that that does not happen. As trustees, I believe we should demonstrably commit to respect, embrace, and support them to understand and to lessen their frustration and their anxiety. If we do that well, then we can deserve a share in the writing of this extraordinary chapter for our state and our system and our VSC. By the time the late 1960s came around, I hoped I had changed. I think I had changed. I was joining marches and we were singing, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Today, we are still yearning for some day. June 10th, Juneteenth was 155 years ago tomorrow. Maybe the time has come for a new Juneteenth, a, repro a reproclamation, this time of genuine justice and genuine freedom. We need our someday very soon. A fellow trustees, Black Lives Matter. Today, as your chair, I encourage each of our campuses and locations, if they have not already done so, to dense, demonstrate sensitivity, solidarity, and welcoming by, by prominently flying the Black Lives Matter flag on their campuses and other locations, or through similarly and equally 
prominent means. The message must be clear to everyone coming onto a campus or through a door of a VCC, a CCV site or at our site in Montpelier. And I would welcome action by this board to endorse that thought. Thank you. Church, I would make a motion to endorse the principle and practice of Black Lives Matter by flying the flags on our campuses. I would second that. I'll second. Church, I would second as well, and I would just broaden it to say maybe include virtually on the website as well. Thank you, Michael. That's a good addition. And I acknowledge that in some places, like our smallest CCV sites, they're probably not a flagpole to be had, but I know that <laughs> our CCV family have ways to to, to fulfill the spirit of this motion. We have a motion, I didn't recall the second, I'm sorry. I think David beat me to it. Okay, da David and Michael seconded. <laughs> Is there uh, uh, discussion or questions? Jim. Yeah, I'd just like to commend you for your remarks, uh, Church, excellent remarks. Well, you perhaps have a better idea of how I spend some of my Sunday mornings. <laughs> And to say that this is uh, this is a, a good and important symbolic step, and it needs to be a step along a persisted journey. You do not accomplish eliminating racism with any symbolic issue, but with our continued vigilance and actions. So I I endorse this and encourage us to continue. Thank you, Bill. I guess, Bill, to follow up on to Bill, someone, a professional friend of mine that I respect greatly, uh, recently published um, a personal call to action. He said we need to make um, our actions personal and we need to commit as individuals to specific action items that we're going to um, accomplish and do them and commit to them publicly so we can be held accountable for them. And it really personalized it for me. And I think it's a really um, good thought exercise for all of us to do um, and uh, and make the um, make the words into actions. Thank you, Michael. Other thoughts or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have passed the motion and thank you very much. We can now begin our busy day. The first item on our agenda as I, as I review what I believe is the correct agenda is approval of the minutes for the May 11th and June 1st uh, meetings of this board. Uh, may we have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Uh, any, we, it has been moved and seconded. Do we have any edits, corrections, deletions, additions, any changes to make to these two sets of minutes? Mr. Chair, if I could very briefly for the board's understanding, the board had actually approved the May 11th minutes uh, at the previous meeting. Unfortunately, uh, we made a correction on those minutes. Uh, the board requested an, an amendment to the minutes. Um, I think in part because we all couldn't believe how long one of the, the May 11th meeting may in fact have gone. Uh, but on further reflection and review of, of the records, our amendment to the minutes was incorrect. Um, and so the board is being asked to approve the minutes as they were originally presented and and not as they were amended and passed. You, is that I, confusing enough? That's, I, I followed that bouncing ball. Good. Any further thoughts or discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes as, as distributed for our May 11th and June 1st meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have done so. Now we have an unusual, but highly anticipated and very welcome uh, step in our roles as trustees. We have the opportunity to bestow faculty emeritus status, which of course is the highest honor that this board can provide to any member of our faculty community. 
And I would like to uh, perhaps um, turn this to uh, Elaine. Are you going to lead us off on this happy occasion? I would be happy to do so. So it's my pleasure today uh, to bring this to your attention uh, related to policy 204. And that is the Professor Emeritus status uh, from Linden State College to Dr. Bruce Berryman. Uh, policy 204, as you know, stipulates uh, six criteria. One is at least 10 years of full-time employment with Vermont State Colleges. Secondly, clear evidence of outstanding teaching or administrative services. Third, recognized record of professional achievement, growth, and development. Fourth, clear evidence of college service beyond the normal or ordinary expectations. Uh, fifth, prospects for continuing service to the Vermont State Colleges. And the last is retired status. And what I can say about um, Dr. Berryman, it's interesting as I read these, you know, they're talking about clear evidence of uh, and, and prospects for continuing service. I can tell you in each of these categories, he has exceeded every single one. He has not done an either or, he's done a both and. So um, Dr. Berryman, I wish I had the pleasure to work with you. Uh, I missed that. I, I guess you uh, left before I was um, brought in to Linden, but uh, you, you are just an amazing person. So Dr. Berryman ultimately served as a faculty in atmospheric sciences for 33 years. Uh, he was an amazing teacher. His students talk about him as making them feel respected in a, a climate and culture where at times they felt that they were uh, overwhelmed by all the intellectuals running around in the meteorology unit. Um, I think that's, that's huge high praise. Uh, he was always visible to students and they commented and appreciated that as well. Many of the students wrote supporting letters. As a matter of fact, there's uh, something like 18 pages of supplemental materials that have been provided to you. Uh, three of them have uh, managed weather stations across Antarctica. They've served as meteorologists at the Weather Channel. One worked as a president of a major company as well. Uh, so, and then I just for, a moment would like to speak about the extraordinary accomplishments beyond just uh, his faculty service that have been made to Linden. Uh, first, by authoring the accreditation reports for several years. And um, as you know, it is that is a difficult process. It's a labor of love. And he was able to successfully guide Linden through uh, multiple years of accreditation. Um, and also he was a coordinator of the $1.7 million Title III grant prior to his retirement in 2015. So for these reasons, um, I, I would like to recommend strongly that you award uh, emeritus status to Dr. Byrne. Thank you, President Collins. Uh, we have a resolution to this effect on page 14, I believe, of the uh, board materials. We could begin our uh, wider discussion if someone would be willing to make a motion that we adopt that resolution. So moved, Church. Second, if you need one. And we are seconded. Um, is there uh, thoughts or questions or comments from trustees? <clears throat> Sounds terrific, Church. Elaine, well, sounds terrific. Well, I, I, I might just indicate, uh, Dr. Berryman, that um, peer review is not an unusual experience for you. <laughs> it probably began when you first applied for undergraduate school and people looked you over and said, well, what do we think? Is he good enough? <laughs> Same thing at graduate school. What do you think? Is he good enough? Can he cut the grade? then through all the protocols that led to your receiving a doctorate. Peer review every step of the way. Joining the faculty. You were looked over very carefully, I'm sure, at that point in time. And um, as a meteorologist, everybody in a very wide circle were constantly reviewing your ability to tell us what was gonna to happen tomorrow. And they were probably fairly happy when you were and fairly ruth ruthless when you when you didn't see that storm front coming. But really, at this point, 
in, um, in your career, my favorite aspect of awarding emeritus status is that one of the critical elements is that your peers within the Linden faculty had to sign on and say, by golly, we can't think of a better person to receive this honor. And every time our board takes this action, I just, I just feel that we're just adding on to that wonderful endorsement from your peers and trust that uh, the little bit that it feels good to us feels really good to you and to your family. Are there further uh, questions or comments or accolades? I Elaine. just have a quick addition. I just wanted to, um, now that you brought this peer review issue to my uh, recollection again, I just wanna say that I met with the full faculty on December 3rd and received a unanimous endorsement for this, Dr. Berryman. Uh, it's very seldom that I get a unanimous endorsement of anything from faculty. So, so that speaks for itself. Thank you. Okay, shall we proceed with the vote? All those in favor of awarding emeritus status for Dr. Bruce Berryman, please say aye. All right. Aye. 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 Are there any nays? <laughs> Don't you dare. Congratulations, Dr. Bruce Berriman. You are our newest emeritus professor. Thank you. I understand that you have members of your family with you today, and they may want to say a couple of words on your behalf that no doubt would discredit everything we've just said that was good about you. Okay. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I don't, I don't see their pictures up, uh, but my, my, my wife, Cara, is here, and um, in the absence of our, our two kids' pictures being, being there, uh, she can start. They are here. We can see them. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I, I can't. I don't know why, but okay. So then why don't we have Nina start then? Very good. Great. Thanks. I'll keep it very brief. And I just want to say, I know personally how much this means to my father. Um, I feel like I grew up at the college, playing in the hallways, finishing my homework in the empty classrooms in the evenings, waiting for him to wrap up and go home. And it really felt like the other faculty and their families were our extended family. So I know how much this means to him personally. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Mage, is Mage there? Yes, hello, Dad. Hello, everyone. Um, just a couple words about my father's academic rigor. Um, that has always inspired me, and it was very meaningful to me when um, he was able to play a large role in my own um, master's degree ceremony, even though I was not attending uh, Linden State College. That was very meaningful. And then, of course, outside the academic environment, um, my dad's teachings have always inspired me. Uh, his land conservation uh, work and teachings has stuck with me in my own profession. His um, teachings about the value of observation is something that I carry with me in my own profession and in my own life. And lastly, a teaching that there's no such thing as bad weather. It's never too hot to stack wood. It's never too cold to shovel. There's, you should always wake up, even if it's the middle of the night, to view a wonderful thunderstorm. And uh, <laughs> of, uh, embracing the circumstances is something that I've uh, learned from him. So thank you. Well, thank you very great. much. That's great. Wonderful. Well, what a joy it was to uh, receive the emeritus news. Our family will never forget the kindness of this special occasion, and we will treasure it forever. Thank you so very, very much. It's a pleasure. A particular pleasure this year when we were not able to be with faculty and students and campuses for commencement, to have at least one little moment to say thank you to you Bruce, and maybe extend that to all of our faculty who we are un unable to applaud and thank um, 
during this uh, usual time of year when we get to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need to move along unless there's... this is our this is our first Zoom emeritus. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I guess we could create a new category. Emeritus. <laughs> I like that. Okay. <laughs> Chancellor Zanatni. Uh, hello. hello. I was going to provide a, a, a just a quick update on the what's going on in the legislature. Um, we did receive some COVID related funding in the Budget Adjustment Act. Uh, we're waiting to receive guidance from the administration in terms of how that money can be spent. We're expecting to get that very shortly, uh, but that was um, just over $12 million, $12.5 million for coronavirus relief fund um, that we can use towards COVID expenses, which includes the room and board reimbursement that the colleges have made to students who had to leave uh, mid-semester, last semester. Uh, the bigger piece is the legislature's first quarter transitional budget, uh, which I understand is on the floor today for a third reading in the Senate. Uh, that provides currently provides $5 million in general funds um, as bridge funding. Uh, it's just for the first quarter. Um, it also provides 22, almost 23 uh, million uh, in additional coronavirus relief funds. So uh, 15 uh, million of that had already been requested previously by the colleges. The Senate had added an additional seven and a half million uh, dollars to that. And again, it is tied to the Coronavirus Relief Act um, and there will be limits in how that money can be spent. And we will, we will be learning more about what it can be spent for. Uh, the other piece in that budget is uh, the uh, Last year's uh, appropriation, base appropriation of around 30 million is being rolled forward. Um, and we have, uh, in, the, in the bill, it provides that we'll receive 25% of that in the first quarter. Obviously the whole budget is going to get revisited when the legislature comes back um, in August and September. But for now, uh, we're slated to receive 25%. Um, in other words, continue with the base appropriation we've had in previous years. Uh, the, the one additional piece on that is that we will be able to draw it down in one piece in July rather than receiving it um, monthly over the first quarter of the coming fiscal year, which should assist with liquidity um, uh, moving forward. The other piece we've got the capital bill is moving forward, which has uh, 2 million and that is not a surprise that was expected. And the only other piece I wanted to uh, bring to your attention is there is a, a bill a Senate bill that's still being discussed, which uh, uh, hopes for its aspirational uh, gender balance on both the UVM board and on this board. Um, so that's still working its way through. Um, as you all know, uh, last week, the treasurer issued her, her report on the Vermont State Colleges that came out, I believe on Monday of last week. And Jim Page, he was the external consultant who'd been hired by the Joint Fiscal Office. His report came out on Tuesday. Both of those reports, um, I believe, were influential um, with the legislature in terms of assessing how much bridge funding uh, to consider providing in the in the first uh, first quarter transitional budget. Uh, there's obviously still further discussion to be had on those pieces, but that was the general legislative overview. Um, again, we did uh, in the Finance and Facilities Committee yesterday. There was a brief discussion about the Treasurer's report and Jim Page's report. If folks want to talk about that, I'd suggest we, we do that when we get the report from the Finance and Facilities Committee uh, in just a few minutes here. But if uh, people have any other questions relating to what's going on over at the State House, I'd be happy to hear those. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, the other piece, which I think we'll probably touch on with the, the Long Range Planning Committee later, is the VSCS uh, Forward Task Force has started meeting. They've had two meetings. We do have an external facilitator working with that group. Um, and again, we can talk about that a little bit more um, with the Long Range Planning Committee. There is language, I should add, in the, um, the, the first quarter budget to create a select committee. Uh, this had started in the House as a proposal to create a select committee to discuss uh, the public, uh, public higher education in the state of Vermont. It was uh, the original proposal was uh, heavily influenced or, or built upon work that had been done by NEBI, the New England Board of Higher Education. 
when the proposal from the House Education Committee got to the Senate, uh, the Senate Education Committee basically did a, a, a a significant rewrite. I mean, they res they limited the number of people that were on the proposed committee, and they really changed the direction of it to be focused solely on the Vermont State College system. Um, I did did uh, listen to the testimony yesterday. Um, Senator Phil Baruth participated in the House Education Committee and explained the changes that he'd made. And um, I believe that will be going forward. His proposed changes will be going forward with one, one minor change um, from Representative Fagan. Um, will be proposed today in the Senate. Um, but that creates a committee of around 15 people. There would be six representatives from the Vermont State College system on it. And the uh, amendment proposed by Peter Fagan was to make clear that UVM and uh, would work with the Vermont State Colleges in terms of addressing, um, meeting some of the goals of higher education in the state of Vermont. But it's very much focused on the Vermont State Colleges rather than being an open, um, committee uh, looking at the whole of public higher education. And my understanding from the testimony yesterday in the House Education Committee is that um, there is interest in once this, the focus is on the VSC given the situation that we find ourselves in, but that the, uh, the legislature has an interest in having a broader discussion about higher education in the state of Vermont um, separate and apart from that, and that maybe there would be another bill looking at a broader committee um, in in next session starting in January. So so again, if there are any questions on that. And I always feel sort of strange saying this, given we have legislative trustees who probably have far more information or better information than I do. But um, that's my understanding, at least of where things stand right now. Any questions or thoughts for Sophie? I have a question. Uh, Sophie was there was there any discussion um, from legislators concerning including um, all of public education in the state of Vermont in the discussion? So the, I don't believe that will be, they talked about that, but I don't believe that will be part of what's being proposed now. It's very focused on the Vermont State College system. Uh, there was recognition, uh, the Senate Education Committee specifically recognized in their proposed rewrite of, um, of the language, uh, they specifically name the task forces that we have going on in the Vermont State College system. So there's, there's a recognition and understanding that we, are all, we ourselves are moving forward uh, with a discussion on these issues and understand the need for change. Um, so the hope is very much that we're not gonna be crossing paths, that we'll all be working uh, together with good communication between the, the different groups. Uh, but they were specifically acknowledged, the VSC ones, which I felt was important. Right. Thank you. Further thoughts or questions? As the... I, I, I Bill, do. Please. Well, and I, I, I... Yes, I am in the legislature and usually uh, up to my eyeballs in healthcare issues, uh, as we have been earlier this week. So actually catching up with some of the other moving parts as uh, former Senator Representative Flory can acknowledge that uh, we have to work very hard sometimes to find out what's happening in other parts of the building. Or, that makes or sense. On, or on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, my, so um, what you just updated me on, I had not heard previously. Uh, and I'm interested in what uh, if there's a time frame in which this legislatively set up committee now more focused on the Vermont State College system is supposed to report or uh, how does that fit with the work that the that this board has set in motion and other committees have set in motion at various college campuses. Yeah, my understanding is that they kept the same time frame that had been in the House <laughs> Education's version. Um, there, there are three reports um, that are time sort of six months apart. So one would be December of this year, June of next year, and then December of 2021. So their timeline is, is longer than ours. Um, you know, we've asked the, the VSCS task force to uh, make a preliminary report back to the board of trustees uh, by mid-August. I think the, we're contemplating that if, if significant change or significant changes really should be identified in the fall, um, because um, if we don't do that, it's going to be a challenge for students to know what's happening moving forward. So we're on a tighter timeline than they are. 
but they they had specific reports um, and and information that they were requesting at specific times in three phases in the uh, version that they currently have, I believe. Thank you. Uh, yes, we will be paying careful attention to the, I guess we call it the parallelism between the prerogatives and responsibilities of the board and the prerogatives and responsibilities of the General Assembly. And I have confidence that Vermont being the place that it is and of the scale that it is, that we will be able to um, uh, align those things together in a way that works for everyone. Uh, Dylan. Yeah, I, I was just gonna uh, thank Sophie for her report here. And just uh, to put this into context, the, um, the House Education Committee had worked with the House Appropriations Committee when they passed a budget to fund the first quarter of the fiscal year through. Uh, and that is where we attached a version of a broader look at higher education in the state. And uh, we just heard yesterday in the House Education Committee on which I serve uh, from the chairperson of the Senate Education Committee who presented a proposal. So I've just copied it into the pane here if anyone wants the link and I'll make sure you get it. Um, and it, we have not heard, or at least I have not as of today, whether that version will proceed but I would assume given the speaker and pro tem's involvement back in April with having public statements around what they would like to see, that they are reviewing the options and will try to agree upon something if it's gonna move in the budget. And so uh, I did not have a final update prior to this meeting, but I'll keep an eye on it. And uh, just wanna acknowledge that uh, Sophie has done a really great job being available throughout the last several weeks as the committee has asked a lot of this system staff in terms of providing feedback, not only the VSCS, but also uh, NEBI, which has been on the table throughout the house process and having the New England Board of Higher Education. And of course our experts here with our public higher education institutions has been a real help. So I just wanna thank Sophie publicly. Oh, thank you, Dylan. Yeah, the only thing that, I, that, that I've that i learned this morning was that um, my understanding is that um, Senator Baruth was uh, willing to accept the proposed language that uh, Representative Fagan from the House Appropriations Committee had proposed. So I don't know if that's in the version you posted or not, but that was to do with the closer collaboration with UVM. Good. Sophie, anything else? Um, not as far as legislative update goes. I don't know if anyone has any other questions beyond what's happening in the legislature, but if, if not, I'm I'm done. Any questions for Sophie? Thank you. We'll move then to some a report from where I sit. This, uh, by the way, is the annual meeting of the board. Uh, recall that we elected officers earlier in the year. Our officers are all now in place. Just a reminder and a confirmation that all committee assignments and, and committee chairs uh, will stay the same for this next year. However, if anyone would like to either add a new committee to their portfolio or offload one and pick up another one, let me know and I can work with the chairs of those committees to, and see if we can accommodate anyone's um, wishes as far as that goes. I'd also like to welcome um, uh, Ryan Cooney to our meeting today. Uh, at least on my screen, he is at the upper left corner. I don't know where he is on everybody else's. But Ryan is our newest trustee. He uh, is a student in the professional piloting program, airplane piloting program at Vermont Technical College and spends most of his time in Williston or in airplanes flying around the Northeastern United States. I wish I'd known you could do that and go to college at the same time. Um, but welcome, Ryan, it's good to have you. Um, just an update on uh, Izzy Gogarty, who spent with, spent the last year with us. It's our understanding that Izzy has accepted a job as a middle school uh, physical education teacher at West Rutland, and she is thrilled be, to be able to stay in Vermont. Uh, she was as mature and grown up as we thought she was because she had a choice between Vermont and Philadelphia and chose Vermont. Um, uh, one of the things that we do at uh, the annual meeting is to adopt a, a working calendar for the year. The board materials on uh, page 15 include a draft of both board and committee meetings 
out through December of 2021. Um, these have been vetted for things like religious holidays, school holidays, and the like. And similar to past practice, we encourage everyone to go ahead now and calendar the dates for your committee meetings, as well as for the board meetings. You'll note that we have tried to continue the practice that we began this year of where multiple meetings need to occur by, meetings have to occur by multiple committees that were possible. We cluster those on the same day. It makes long days for some people, but for people who are very busy, sometimes it's easier to block out the entire day and attend to two or three committees all at once rather than doing it over multiple days. I'd call your attention to September 22nd and 23rd, ske currently scheduled for the annual board meeting and retreat. Uh, that uh, uh, time is, you know, we all are uncertain as to whether or not that meeting, those meetings over those two days are going to be in person or over Zoom. Well, we will have to wait and see as far as that goes. Um, Zoom, the Zoom or not Zoom is a little bit complicated. Um, as we know, uh, Governor Scott is turning the spigot a quarter turn at, at a time. And as he allows more and more people to be together in a big room, we um, are getting closer and closer to when the numbers could conceivably work for the board. The issue with the board, however, certainly speaking for myself, are five of us, at least five of us fall into the high risk category. So the first quarter turn would not necessarily include people who have hair like mine. Um, so as we get closer to that, we're going to need to um, stay in touch with each other. I think we've gotten pretty good at using Zoom and see whether uh, we want to all be in the same room together whether we want to be all in the same Zoom together or whether um, contemporary meeting practice has developed any kind of a hybrid where at-risk people can be participating electronically and everybody else can be enjoying their fellowship and drinking cocktails together in the evening while we have to go back and eat food that's smooth and easy to digest and get an early night um, befitting our ages. Uh, so stay tuned for that. The other question I would have on the retreat, uh, we have traditionally held that retreat at Lake Maury and other locations as well, but more recent, in recent, recent years at Lake Maury. And if I could just ask you to share some thinking, if we are allowed to all be together physically, including the at-risk folk, um, would you like to do that at Lake Maury, or would you prefer that we do that at our offices in Montpelier or perhaps on a campus if they can accommodate us? That's right in the middle of a, of a semester. Um, some have said that we should be mindful of the cost. I believe the Lake Maury event typically runs in the neighborhood of about $9,000 for the over the two days for use of the space and accommodations and meals. Uh, I wonder if there's any thinking about if, assuming we could be all together, where you would like to have that um, retreat and board meeting in September happen. Hey, Church. Hi, Michael. Yeah, one consideration I would um, make is the size of the room that we can secure. I don't really think the chancellor's office is probably big enough for us all to be together. It's a really tight space. Um, so I think we'd want to, even, even in September, if we were in person, we'd want to be spread out pretty, pretty, uh, at a pretty good, uh, distance. So I think that's a consideration we should take into account. We have chatted a little bit. We know that there is large space available at NVU Linden and at, uh, Castleton at least. And I think at our other campuses as well, as well, um, Judd Hall, Judd Hall, for example, at Randolph is, is, a, is a large space. Bill? I, I would just note that 
in, we are going to be in the unusual position of the legislature actually being in session during September, and we are going to be <laughs> dealing uh, with some very critical issues. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not at all certain uh, that legislative trustees are going to be available for two full days or even a day and a half. If there are, as there were this week, I, I'm sorry I had to miss things early, yesterday and uh, rescheduled a few things today, but there are, there are critical votes and deliberations both in committees and on the floor that we may not be able to uh, be absent for. So both location, that, that may speak to a location issue, but it also, even if it's uh, nearby, it, uh, it's, it's an unknown at this point, but, it, but what is known is I feel confident, unfortunately, <laughs> that we will be in session during September. And you may be dealing with things that are quite of high interest to us and we'll want you to be in session. Yes. Uh, so listen, what I'd like to do if we could is entertain a motion to adopt this as a draft mm. calendar so that um, people can start putting things on, uh, into their personal schedules as we work out those realities, Bill. Um, I do hope that we can find time in September that would work for everyone, but maybe it's going to have to be something as unusual as uh, Sunday evening, Monday sort of thing to accommodate uh, the General Assembly or some other creative solution. Other thoughts and questions about our calendar for the year? James. Yeah, I'm happy to move to adopt the draft calendar with regards to Bill Lippert's very sensible comments. I wonder if there's a way, if some of the um, <clears throat> trustees are meeting in a location. Um, if there's a way for participate for for the legislators to participate on a large screen in a room somehow or rather so that when we have something erudite to say we can be more present than just on a little teeny weeny screen but it um, I'm sure we can figure it out and maybe a large TV screen would be um, too grandiose for us but <laughs> but it who knows? I'm sure we can figure something out. I've always wanted to see you, Jim, on one of those great big screens that they have at the ballpark. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. I think Jumbotron, right? A Jumbotron. <laughs> or it could be a Zoom, a Zumbotron. Right. That would be good. That would be good. So, but again, for personal planning purposes, uh, yes, David. Well, I know it's may may sound symbolic, but. Um, given our finances, uh, spending $9,000, that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I struggle with that. Certainly, you know, here, you know, we wouldn't do that if we were in the shape we're in, that's for sure. Are you suggesting, David, that we ought to adopt this calendar with the understanding that we will not be at, at Lake Maury and... Uh, uh, location and, and technology be to be term, to be determined. Uh, yes, that's what I'm suggesting. Okay, can we can we consider the the motion with that understanding? Yes. Is there further comment or discussion on our calendar for the year for committees and board meetings? And as veteran board meetings know all too well, uh, interspersed will be a few special ones along the way. All those in favor of adopting the. Um, calendar as described and deleting the references to Lake Maury, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, I'd like to, during the uh, public part of our meeting today to uh, give an update on the Chancellor's Search Committee. Uh, this search, as everyone, uh, as many know, I wouldn't presume everyone because we have a lot of people with us today, uh, this search is for a special time limited chancellorship to lead the Vermont State College system and its four colleges and universities through a year of redesign, transformation, and transition. And uh, a committee of the board has been uh, appointed to do so. Uh, the uh, uh, selection and appointment of a chancellor is a board responsibility. So in keeping with past practice, this is a board committee. And let me just remind people who, who are serving on this, uh, trustee uh, Adam Reynold of Wilmington, Megan Kluver of Hinesburg, 
uh, Trustee Lynn Dickinson of St. Albans, Jim Maislin of Thetford, Karen Luno of St. Albans, Ryan Cooney of Vermont Tech and Springfield, Vermont, his hometown, and myself. This committee has been busy. It has been meet, meeting uh, twice weekly. Uh, attendance has been excellent. Um, we are working within three key parameters that our goal is to conduct our affairs in a way that the trustees are fully informed along the way so that when we do come to uh, a recommendation, the board will feel they're making a, a fully informed decision. Uh, secondly, to engage and uh, listen to our stakeholders and constituents. And we'll, uh, I'll talk a little more about that in a, in a moment. And thirdly, the, perhaps the biggest challenge is expedience to try to complete our work in as expedient a way as possible. In terms of uh, constituent or, or uh, stakeholder engagement, on Monday, beginning at one o'clock, we, we will be warning a meeting of the search committee, which will in effect be an open forum via Zoom for uh, everyone who cares to provide feedback to the search committee, suggestions, perspectives, issues, things on their mind. It is going to be structured in such a way that we will um, try to organize testimony so that we hear from uh, faculty and uh, faculty related presentation and staff and staff related and student and student related. And then at that point, I think our goal is to then, then turn to a, a, a wider community of those who might be in attendance, whether they are um, local town officials or economic development uh, organizations or uh, employer partners or whoever it might be. The committee will be there and we will be all ears. In parallel with the live open forum on Tuesday, we will also be posting a survey monkey device to solicit um, similar input um, so that if people are unable to um, attend the open forum or if, it, or if they prefer to share their thoughts uh, in writing instead of verbally, we'll be able to uh, receive that as well. And I believe the plan is for the survey monkey to be up for several days. I believe it we're thinking about a week um, for that. Um, the committee in parallel with uh, receiving external input are also engaged in uh, speaking, having conversations with potential individuals who may have interest in this unique uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, those conversations uh, will, will continue throughout the process and they will be informed by and guided by feedback that we receive. We expect to complete our work uh, within the next few weeks because um, as we'll learn under the uh, long range planning committee presentation, things are happening in every college and we have, uh, we, we, there is momentum, there is engagement, there is traction, whatever term of art you like to employ. And we need to uh, have uh, the long-term leadership for this year ahead clarified and in place as quickly as possible. And finally, minutes of our uh, search com committee meetings as usual are available on the VSC website. I think I would like to invite other members of the search committee to correct anything I've said, stuff a sock in my mouth, uh, uh, anything, that, anything else that other members of the committee would like to um, uh, uh, add to my summary update. Good summary, Church. Okay. Um, I will uh, note one thing in her report, Sophie mentioned the possible legislation uh, uh, relating to gender balance in our, uh, in our board. Uh, as we know, this is um, Peg Flory's final um, uh, time with us, excuse me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get over it, Peg. Uh, seriously, this is Peg's final time with us. We have been in close communication 
with the governor's office, Peg's seat is a gubernatorial appointment, uh, reminding the, uh, uh, those who take care of that process on behalf of the governor of the, this pending legislation. But more important, it, our, our um, uh, sense as a board that we really like being balanced. It's good for us to be balanced in terms of gender, age, um, geography, perspective, whatever it might be and encouraging them to bear that in mind as they, as they make their appointment. I think Church. that- Yes, Peg. Does that mean you're looking for an old lady to take my seat? <laughs> That's the way it sounds. I'm not, I'm not to come anywhere near that, Peg. <laughs> smart man. Thank you. Any, any other questions before we move on to our committee reports? Okay. Uh, I am looking for, there we are, Linda, welcome. I haven't been able to see you until this point. Uh, may we have a report from the audit committee, including some uh, educational materials that you're, you were able to ha have for us that, um, or interesting reading, by all means. Can can we unmute, Linda? I got it. I unmuted. Thank you. Welcome. So I managed to get on just in time for the audit committee report. Perfect. Oh, wow. Okay. Great. You could not have done better. <laughs> hmm. All right, well, the uh, audit committee met with the um, with our auditors, O'Connor and Drew, um, specifically for planning of the audit of the fiscal year that begins or that ends June 30th, 2020. So just at the end of this month, oh, uh, largely they are planning to do that remotely or electronically, um, the audit, certainly all the planning as they have successfully done in the past. Um, quite a few issues we talked about um, for this year, um, or maybe not issues, but risk assessments items they um, take into account in planning for their audit and assessing the risk of their auditing, including uh, lots of new staff in the finance area. Since we have Wayne Hamilton um, replace Sheila, um, another director of financial operations, Jocelyn Hall, we have a new chancellor. Um, and the fact that, in fact, our uh, CFO, Steve, will leave at the end of June. So although he's here the whole fiscal year, when they're doing much of the audit, they'll be working with somebody else. Payroll implementation. And the issues with that, of course, caused risks. Uh, revenue recognition questions related to the uh, COVID um, financial assistance, um, the COVID relief funds. Um, and when those expenses and revenues are recognized, also potential of that question related to bridge loans, things that they'll be figuring out sometime after June 30th. Um, and then of course we had a refinancing of uh, debt in February, 2020. So those were all the risk issues we, the auditors and we discussed with the auditors. And then they also talked about how the pages in the front of the financial report, financial report called the MDNA, Management Discussion and Analysis, will take significant discussion and new discussion from our management team regarding the impact of COVID-19 and how management will have to be considering and documenting their consideration of the Vermont State College's ability to remain a going concern for one year from the financial statement date, which is likely to be October. And 
that that is the item the church was referring to with the materials um, that were provided in the uh, in the audit pack for the education of the board. It's management's job to make that assessment and document it, to document their plans as to how to address those risks. And then the auditors will, as part of their report, make sure they're comfortable with um, that assessment. And that will determine whether the auditors get to say, okay, this is a clean opinion, or gee, um, this is clean, but for we have concerns about that disclosure, or gee, this is not a clean opinion because we don't think they've even considered that. Um, I'm, I management had with the board of the audit, and I feel pretty comfortable that's already been assessing that and will in fact have an assessment and documentation and a plan for the auditors to consider um, and that um, they'll have plenty of dis appropriate disclosure in the financial statements um, about that. So those are a lot of big issues, probably the most big issues we've had in um, discussion wise in talking about planning for an audit in quite some time. Thank you, Linda. Linda, with your through this. Thank you. Thorough uh, review of the uh, the meet year of uh, O'Connor Drews. Uh, and so at the end, uh, or an extension of their existing. And the. Oh, go ahead, David. Uh, Steve, have they um, rotated audit, audit partners your term, or do they have a requirement that they this year? Um. They, they don't necessarily rotate every five years. In the time that we have had a contract with them, uh, their first audit partner was Chris Stenman. He rotated off um, a few years, maybe the beginning of uh, this contract when uh, Keith Goldie became the audit partner and actually had become a partner just shortly um, before that. So. We, do, we don't have a policy that requires audit change every four to five years, nor do they, but we do look at rotating audit partners, absolutely. Thank you. Further thoughts or questions for Linda and the audit committee? Thank you, Linda. Let's move ahead to the finance committee. Uh, uh, Trustee uh, Silverman and Steve. Um, uh, five different approvals at least from the overachieving a com committee. Uh, <laughs> David and Steve, you want to walk us through, please? Sure. Um, happy to do that. Um, with uh, a, a question first, I think uh, Sophie referred to the two reports from the treasurer and Jim Page and speaking to those during this session. And my suggestion would be to save that and cover that when we cover the resolution regarding the interim budget, because those things tie together pretty nicely, I think. Does that work for you, Church? Yes, it does. Okay, great. So uh, we've met uh, a couple of times um, since the, the last board meeting. Uh, we met on May 11th and again yesterday. Um, and uh, we do have a um, significant amount of action items and I'd like to walk through those um, and then we can get into the dis discussion about the uh, two uh, financial reports. Uh, the first uh, item is a recommendation from the committee uh, regarding the Elaine H. and Suk Nam Co. International Student Scholarship Fund, uh, which is being established in the amount of $40,000 for Castleton University. Um, and this is targeted at um, helping international students at Castleton uh, attend the school. And um, I would uh, like to make a motion to approve that uh, grant application or, or uh, fellowship application. Do you is have there a second? Second. Is there a discussion concerning the uh, establishment of this endowment? 
Jonathan, did you want to speak to this at all? Thank you, David. I always like to speak, but I know that our time is precious today. So this is just, I'll say, a very, very worthy endeavor, and it honors uh, one of our first international students from Asia. And we're just so thrilled that his wife and children are being uh, incredibly generous by creating the scholarship. It's going to be great for Vermont and great for international students. So thank you, David, for allowing me to uh, uh, endorse this uh, move by the board. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as made, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We have a, we have approved the, the motion. Uh, the next action items um, are um, brought to you as a result of policy 408, um, which requires board approval for grants uh, in excess of $750,000. I'd like to suggest that we take these all as a group. Um, there's a Castleton unit. Four of these are related to the CARES Act. Uh, two, two grants for Castleton, both in the amount of 878,000, uh, two for Northern Vermont University in the amount of 966,000. Um, the reason you're not seeing applications for the other schools is simply because they fell underneath the $750,000 um, policy limit. And then finally, a, a SBDC grant in the amount of $1,280,000 uh, for Vermont Technical College. And I would uh, make that in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Sure. Doug, seconds. Thank you. Questions and comments from David on these grant approvals. Mr. Chair, oh, sorry, I'll wait till after this motion is done. Okay. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to uh, approve these grants, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have approved the grants. We move now to the next resolution. And actually, Mr. Chair, if I could speak up here uh, and, and uh, David and Church both, um, we just became aware today that the state is um, getting ready to distribute that first 12.515 million under House Bill 953, which I believe has now had an act number assigned to it. Uh, but they are going to be distributing that funding to us subject to a grant agreement, which I understand I'm going to be receiving today to sign. Okay. Uh, following the letter of policy 408, we'd actually need board approval for that because it exceeds $750,000. Um, at this point, I might ask either the uh, interim chancellor or the interim general counsel to advise as to process but since everybody is here, and since apparently that funding is otherwise available to be distributed, I thought we might try to address that, uh, at, at least in some fashion, while we're all here. The Todd, do you want to do you want to make a recommendation? Um, certainly, Stephen. Thank you for flagging this. I, I think at this point, um, recognizing that in many ways this additional funding. Uh, from the state is more in the form of our our normal appropriations, but also appreciating that it will likely have um, requirements akin to a grant. I think the closer that the board can hew to the requirements of 408, the better. Um, but I think it would be appropriate. Uh, I would recommend one of two courses. Either the board could recognize and waive the requirements of 408, which require a formal grant proposal and for that proposal to pass through the Finance and Facilities Committee with a recommendation to the full board. Um, so the board could either waive that requirement and vote on an appropriate motion today to accept the grant funding or empower the CFO and interim chancellor to accept appropriate grant terms. Um, and we've accepted funds from uh, grant funds from the state before. I don't anticipate this grant agreement being significantly different, but as Steve points out, we haven't seen it yet. Um, the other alternative would be for the board to grant uh, preliminary approval anticipating that there would be a special meeting uh, somewhere in the coming few days to give final formal approval. 
So those would be my two recommendations. I'm not sure if the interim chancellor has anything to say. The, the only other piece I would add is that uh, we are under somewhat of a time constraint here because the funds are technically for FY20. Um, and I know the uh, Business Affairs Council uh, would like to get moving. Um, in addition to which these do relate to coronavirus expenses. So things like building modifications, ordering protective equipment, those are all things we need to be moving forward with. So if there's a way to expedite this, the better. I would agree. So could one of us offer, and uh, as a board member, offer an, a, um, a resolution or to um, that the board approve acceptance of the um, state um, appropriation related to the Budget Adjustment Act in the amount of 12.2, do I have that number right? Yeah. Um, and that we um, provide authority to the interim chancellor to uh, sign any such documentation. Yeah, the amount I believe is 12.5, but I mean, 12 .5, yes, it's from sorry, the budget. I, it's, I don't worry, it's from the Budget Adjustment Act. So I think if we're budget clear that adjustment. that's where the money's coming from, that's okay. 12.5, yeah. I, I, think I, I was trying to get as many details in as I could, but. Uh, Linda, I think if we give um, give uh, Todd and Jennifer authority to kind of fine tune the grammar and everything, we can capture the the sense of, of your motion and and go ahead and act on that basis, David. So, um, given the size of this grant and thinking about governance, could the board give the finance committee authority to vet the grant? Um, document and, and have us have a special committee meeting that doesn't require the full board to execute on this. I mean, I'm, I do trust management, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> um, is there any way to have our cake and eat it too? Um, I, 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 David, I have no problem with, with your committee taking this up and then bringing it back to the board if it has to happen in that particular sequence. I, I don't recall the details of, of the policy at hand. Can I, can I suggest, just suggest that uh, uh, the motion be amended to say, uh, give approval for accepting the grant and signing for it from uh, the interim chancellor uh, after review and uh, approval by the finance committee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like that amendment. Thank you, Bill. Okay. With that amendment, oh, we have I, I have a question. question. Um, I, yes, Lynn. Todd gave another alternative, which was to waive policy 408, uh, which apparently we have done before, if I understood him correctly. Um, you're talking about at least one or two more meetings um, in the next week. I would prefer to just, personally in my mind, I don't have time to go to two more meetings. I've already got 65 meetings next week. Um, all over the place. Um, so I'm just wondering if we should just waive the policy, process this thing through, and then it's a grant, give the proper authority to whoever is supposed to be dealing with this. It's a lot of money, but it's not, this is not breaking news. We've been talking about this for the past two weeks, so. We do have a motion on the floor, I believe. Do we, did we have a second to Linda's I proposal? second the amendment as a place to yes. continue this discussion. Thank you, Jim. Um, and, and while you're looking in my direction and everybody else on the screen too, um, I'd maybe inquire of, of Todd, what's the most expeditious from the attorney's perspective way yeah. of getting this done in a timely manner? I mean, that's a governance question. I, I think more than a legal question, Jim, the, the, oh. you know, I think David has raised an important governance concern in terms of committee oversight. Um, I absolutely hear you Lynn, and can't quite imagine what your meeting schedule looks like. From a legal perspective, I think um, you are closer to the language of 408 
with the amendment that Bill has proposed and you have seconded, Jim, um, to be, you know, as Lynn lays out, the quicker route is to, to waive and move forward today. So can I just jump in here and say, I recognize Lynn's issue. Uh, uh, David, you serve as the treasurer of the board. Yes. As well as the chair of the finance committee. Uh, could I suggest that we further modify the motion to say that after review with the chair of the, with the treasurer of the board and the chair of the finance committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and if, and if, and if David in that role recommends that the full finance committee review it, so be it. And that, that should happen as well, but uh, let's make it expeditious, but uh, continue to have the proper board involvement. But it does, I agree with Lynn. We, so I think that maybe that might satisfy that need. I accept. Mike, I think that's a good suggestion. David? I'm willing. Okay. So we trust, uh, Todd, that you and Jennifer can fine tune the language to reflect our intent. Uh, yes, if I may also attempt to restate it now for Jen's sake um, and for recording's sake and to make sure I am not going to mistakenly edit your intent uh, on the back end. So at this point, what the board would be um, providing is a waiver of the requirements of policy 408 no, and authorizing no, the interim chancellor. We're not waiving the policy. We're approving no, the policy the requires... We're approving as the board, if the resolution was to approve the grant, um, appending the, um, and, and assigning responsibility for approving the, uh, after reviewing and approving the language with the um, interim chancellor, with consultation with the treasurer and chair, chair of the finance. finance. Okay, I, I understand that and perhaps my language was not uh, clear enough. Policy 408 requires a proposal from the chancellor or president to be approved by the Finance and Facilities Committee and recommended to the board. So that is the portion of 408 I'm suggesting be waived. That's what we'll in lieu waiting. of that, yeah, in lieu of that, just as Linda has laid it out, the grant is approved to be accepted by the interim chancellor in consultation with the treasurer and chair of the Finance and Facilities Committee. Okay. It's being approved clear? by the board pending those things. Good. Yeah. Is that, oh, uh, Peg. Church, um, I guess this is uh, for legal counsel. Uh, let's assume Dave sees something in there that causes him concern. What would happen then? I think it would depend if there was a conflict between the interim chancellor's determination to sign for the grant. Uh, if in her consultation with the treasurer, as I understand the motion and the board's will, um, yeah, I suppose conceivably the interim chancellor could accept the grant uh, in contrast or, or in contradiction to the consultation with the treasurer. Um, but I would also recommend that this body has significant control over the chancellor. <laughs> so yeah but I, I, and i would hope that that dave would not be, the treasurer would not be quiet and i don't expect um he would that that conflict would be i just wanted to make sure that we had the language to reflect did you need agreement between them or just review well as i understand it now consultation. It's, it's consultation it, it certainly could be pending the approval of the yeah. treasurer. Yeah, review and approval by the treasurer of the board and the chair of the finance committee to recommend yeah. to, to recommend to the cha interim chancellor uh, to sign. That's what I was thinking. I, I would think if that's what it is, and let's say the chancellor says, let's go for it. And Dave says, uh-uh, there's bad stuff in here. Then Dave would have the ability to call a meeting of the uh, finance committee. Absolutely. Correct? Yeah. And then could go to the full board if it had to. Um, but the only way you're gonna get that it's, is if it's with review and approval. Yeah. 
That's and what that's I was. What I that's what, when I made my amendment, when I made my I amendment, that that's what language. I intended. As the person who first offered the um, the resolution, I like that review and approval of the treasurer and finance chair. Thank you. Okay. So, so for what it's worth, my understanding is we're going to get information, a grant from the state. I will work with Dave and with Church to review it. If we, if all three of us are comfortable with it, we'll move forward with signing it and 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 move along. If we don't, then we'll go back to the Finance and Facilities Committee to have a look at it. If if we have disagreement, I mean, we may have some concerns we push back with the state against, but that's you know that's a separate issue. Um, but right. yeah, I I will not go rogue. I will work with Church and with Dave before we. You might agree start to do by this. saying to the state, "Thank you." Yes, yeah. yes. We are very I'm thankful. Gonna, I'm going to suggest that we might are be very the thankful. That yeah, might be the appropriate approach from this board. And as, as, as Todd says, we don't, we're not anticipating it to be, you know, something uh, really extreme. So hopefully it will all, uh, we are very, we are very appreciative to the legislature as well before we get to the administration uh, sending us the guidance. So but thank you, Card, it's making its way around the table. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. We have great clarity about what this motion uh, proposes to do. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say hi. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. David, you still have a little work to do here. I, I do indeed. And Steve, uh, thank you so much for flagging that so that we were able to handle it here instead of scrambling in a couple of days. Um, and thank you, everybody. Yeah, that, that's I apologize perfect. for the short notice that that just literally came to us today. That uh, <laughs> this is how we were going to have to document this. So. No, much better to have dealt with it. So that that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have some resolutions to look at. Um, uh, the first one is a new resolution uh, 2020-005 which is the annual banking and investment resolution that we authorize uh, management uh, both at the system level and at the college and university level to uh, maintain their banking relationships. And I'd make a motion uh, on that resolution. Is there a second? We have a second. Any discussion on the annual banking uh, Banking and investment resolution. See, there's no material difference between this and the ones we've done in the past. Yeah, and maybe the only mention I would say is if people you know, read through it, you might have seen that it still includes reference to Johnson State and Linden State Colleges. That's merely because those names still appear on some of the legacy bank accounts. So we'll be working to change that administratively, uh, but we do need to keep that in place for the coming year. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor in favor of adopting the annual banking and investment resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We've adopted the resolution. Um, on to waiving policy 410. Okay, so uh, I have before you resolution 2020-006, which is a waiver of the policy 410, which speaks to financial aid and other financial awards. Uh, for this year. This is an action that we've been doing annually for a while because the policy that we're waiving was created quite a long time ago. I think Steve, you mentioned it may be our oldest policy, um, but it, it, it contains what has become very unrealistic restrictions with regards to financial aid and discounting. And current practices have far, far exceeded what that uh, policy contemplated. And so I would uh, make a motion that we uh, provide a waiver to policy 410 for uh, the fiscal year 2020. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to adopt the resolution as worded that would waive uh, temporarily uh, policy 410. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have adopted a resolution temporarily waiving policy 410. We'll now move to 
a resolution temporarily waiving policy 433. So before you, we have uh, resolution 2020-007, a waiver of policy 433, which is our debt management policy. Um, this policy requires that um, any new debt arrangements that we enter into uh, have either a level payment arrangement or a declining one. Um, in the refinance that we did this last, I guess it was February, um, the provisions in that actually provided for some uh, payment relief during the first few years of that policy. But as a result of that, in 2025, our um, payments uh, gradually go, well, essentially they go up. Um, and so as a result, we need to extend the waiver of that policy. I think it currently goes through 2021, Steve, or 22? Correct, yes. And then, then it starts again in 2022. And so we're asking for it to now be extended through 2024 to resume again in fiscal 25. Right. So, um, you know, we've essentially uh, bound ourselves to those bonds and we need to waive a waiver of the policy through 2024 so that we don't violate that policy. Um, and I would make that in the form of a motion. There a second. I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair, just to clarify, all that this is seeking to do is waive that specific provision. The rest of, of policy 433 would still be in force. Okay is merely to the, the level or declining debt service requirement of that policy. Thank you, Steve. So sure thank you. Any further questions or clarification? Comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the resolution to temporarily waive a provision of policy 433, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have done so. We move now, I believe, to the final resolution from the Finance and Facilities Committee having to do with the FY21 budget. So what I what I would recommend is that I go ahead and uh, make a resolution, get a motion and second, and then enter into discussion with regards to uh, the uh, tre treasurer's report, as well as the Jim Page report, and then finally uh, address the actual vote on the um, first quarter budget. Um, so the first thing I would do is uh, is is uh, move. Resolution 2020-008, which is the approval of the fiscal 2021 transitional system first quarter budget for the period July through September 30. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Go ahead, David. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to lean on Steve pretty hard on this next uh, uh, section, but I will tell you that uh, the Finance Committee uh, walked through uh, the two reports yesterday fairly thoroughly, and I'm pretty sure that the trustees have had access to that, those two reports as well. Um, you know, my takeaways uh, from those reports taken together were that the treasurer uh, found our financial records to be in good order and that our assessment was generally on the mark as far as the financial condition and what we could expect in the future. Uh, and, you know, both of the reports looked at um, the impact of the pandemic uh, using three different scenarios, uh, a sort of a hoped for case, a worst case and a worst case and basically came out with a range of uh, potential losses that we would need help funding on. And in the page report, um, made further recommendations on how the help might be distributed and the amount of the legislative set aside that might be required uh, to get us through this process. And, um, I think from there, Steve, maybe you could give a little bit more color on that, um, if you would. 
Thank you. Although I, I think that was actually pretty thorough, David. Uh, you know, the treasurer's report, I believe, so Treasurer Beth Pierce wrote one report and then former University of Maine System Chancellor Jim Page uh, wrote the second. Both were at the request of the legislature. Uh, and the treasurer's report was, was very narrow in focus. It was simply, what is the deficit for the remainder of fiscal 20? And what is the range of forecast deficits under a number of enrollment for scenarios for fiscal 21? And so, uh, you know, fiscal 20, uh, the treasurer agreed with our uh, Q3 projection, which was for about a $5.7 million loss to year end. Uh, however, you know, that has since uh, basically been closed uh, by uh, the passage of H 953, uh, which I understand is now signed and it's Act 109. Um, so, so fortunately, it looks like fiscal 20 will be balanced. However, in fiscal 21, again, a uh, tremendous amount of uncertainty because we don't know uh, whether we're going to be operating in person or remotely. And um, there still is a, a fair amount of evolution of enrollment projections for the coming year uh, that we need to understand. So in those three scenarios, uh, the, the better scenario or better middle scenario was about a $19.3 million deficit. The worst scenario corresponded to a $36.3 million deficit. And then the worst scenario, which contemplated no in-person instruction, no residential life uh, meal plans, uh, a $46.3 million deficit. So that was the first report and the scope of the first report. And then uh, former Chancellor Page's report, again, under contract with the General Assembly, um, basically took those scenarios, uh, agreed with them, and uh, there was overlap. Actually, Jim Page sat in on uh, much of the, uh, the conference calls and the work that went into the treasurer's report. And so he agreed with those three scenarios and then further made the recommendation uh, for 30 million of bridge funding. Uh, and then if in-person instruction were not to happen, an additional 10.3 million of funding, uh, which may or may not be available through the uh, coronavirus relief fund. And, uh, and then also had some prescriptions towards the end of his report uh, as to trying, uh, as to the system to really try to work in a coordinated fashion uh, to deploy those resources. So for example, uh, if there were a need for remote instruction uh, and that required a considerable additional investment in information technology, uh, that those purchases be done in a coordinated fashion as opposed to college by college. And so that was my, my general takeaway from both reports. Thank you. So uh, moving, well, first of all, are there any questions for Steve or I or the rest of the committee with regards to the, the two aforementioned reports? David, okay. the only thing I would mention is, and particularly in the uh, treasurer's report, when you look at the individual college by college uh, exhibits, it's clear how much work was done by uh, the Business Affairs Council and their, and their uh, teams on each, in each of the individual colleges to accumulate, uh, accumulate the data and the presentations that uh, Treasurer Pierce asked for. And I think it's, and I, and I recall when that was all happening, it was happening very, very quickly uh, took a lot of personal time away from people. And I really uh, think we owe, a, owe thanks to Steve and his team centrally, but also to each of our uh, teams all, at, at the university and college level to have uh, put all of that together, because I agree the outcomes have been very supportive. Thank you, Church. I couldn't agree with you more. There was yeoman's work involved in pulling this together timely and really without being able to pull it together timely and approach the legislature, we couldn't have approached the legislature without uh, being able to do that work. So I think thanks are definitely in order. Um, you know, the final topic is, is, is approving a three month uh, budget uh, before the end of 
this fiscal year and you might almost want to look at this as a spending authorization to allow the colleges to continue to function and and the system to continue to function um, under a temporary or interim budget because we you know there's so much uncertainty that developing a budget for the full year uh, has been difficult and it's all and our timing on budget development has been knocked entirely off course because of responses uh, to the pandemic. And so essentially what we've done is we've presented uh, what we believe will look look very similar to what will be a an annual budget but um, without refinement and essentially divided that by a fourth and are recommending uh, the approval of, uh, of that budget um, for the first 90 days. And I would make that as in the form of a motion. Is there a second? I second. Is there further discussion of the resolution adopting an FY21 transitional budget for the period through September 30th? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the resolution as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have approved a transitional budget for the first 90 days of the new year. And, and as indicated, we are really mimicking the work that the General Assembly has done, the University of Vermont have done, and, and, and others as well. David, is there more from finance? Uh, unless I'm missing a page of the agenda, no. <laughs> Okay. Steve, any more from you? No, that was everything. Thank you all very much. Okay. We're in good order through the 30th. We then move ahead to the report of the Education Personnel and Student Life Committee, the so-called EPSL Committee. Chairman Jim and Yasmin. Yasmin, take it away. Uh, yes, so I'm very pleased uh, the EPSL Committee met. We covered a lot of ground and we have a few action items for you, that wasn't the entirety of the agenda um, back on June 1st, but the first action item is to um, approve our VSC faculty fellow for the fall, Dr. Greg Petrix. I'd love to turn it over to President Collins, perhaps. Thank you, Yasmeen. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Greg Petrix. Uh, with all of the conversations that we've been having about um, the benefits of open educational resources and how they reduce costs for students. Greg is a, is a uh, faculty member who takes full advantage of this type of resource. Uh, during his sabbatical, he spent it designing some materials uh, specific to calculus for a single variable, uh, and now is searching to uh, continue this work by creating another open educational resources, but this time uh, for calculus related to several variables. So as a faculty member, uh, Dr. Petrick's students depict him as very gifted, very passionate, always excited about mathematics. What I particularly appreciate about Dr. Petrick's, and I can't say this about all faculty, is that he's equally effective with his gifted students, as well as the students who are struggling in math. And I think that is, um, that is a very special gift. On campus, Dr. Petrix has distinguished himself in many ways. He's served on the faculty evaluation committee. He has chaired the uh, curriculum committee many times. He has been on the uh, quantitative reasoning committee. He was the, on the search committee and co-chaired that for our NVU provost. He served on the Chancellor's Faculty Advisory Board and also the NEASC uh, reaccreditation re team. Uh, and in a time when we didn't have much IR happening at our institution, he was the one who always stepped forward and provided meaningful data for us to analyze our processes. So uh, with that said, I would give him my highest recommend recommendation and um, urge you to support him as your next faculty fellow. Thank you. Any thoughts or comments about awarding uh, faculty fellow status to Dr. De uh, Greg Petrix? Um, Jim. Yeah, um, I would move that we do that. And um, 
President Lane, at some point, I'd like to talk to him about some um, goings on, good goings on, but basically at the local high schools that I represent where the heads of schools have found that some of the good classroom teachers struggled online and some of the classroom teachers that um, maybe weren't zippity doo dah I mean, good teachers um, have turned out to excel online. And I'd be glad to have a conversation with people on why that occurs. I, I think Dr. Nolan Atkins would be very interested in that okay. topic as well. Well, we could set up a little meeting sometime. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Further thoughts or questions? So. Then all, the, all those in favor of the motion to approve faculty fellow status for Dr. Greg Petrix, please say hello. Uh, please. <laughs> it's heat stroke. It's heat stroke. Please say aye. We need aye. a second, Mr. Yes, we didn't have a second. Any opposed? We need a second. Oh, second. Okay. Did, did we have a second? Um, Peg did. Peg. Okay, thank Peg. you. All in favor? Aye. aye. Yes, aye. Any opposed? We have done so. Congratulations, Dr. Petrix. Jim. Jim, would you like me to jump in on this next item? Yes, please, yes, me. So the second uh, action item is a classroom recording policy. Um, this is something that uh, Epsil has heard about a bit and what you're seeing in your packet is uh, just a few kind of editorial revisions to what EPSL uh, looked at a few weeks ago. Um, but in essence, this is a brand new policy for us. Um, and it really reflects the increasing use of video recording as uh, we're all experiencing right now, but faculty are making good use of this in our teaching. And of course, what this policy essentially is doing is um, making clear that that's an educational record protected by FERPA. Um, and that we need to be mindful about how we use those classroom recordings. So um, we will be rolling out um, information about this policy in conjunction with um, new uh, video recording and editing software. Um, and I just have to acknowledge um, there is such tremendous hard work going on across our colleges by our faculty in continuing to adapt and to plan for many scenarios for the fall. Um, we are going to be choosing a software very soon. We've had a lot of faculty involved in looking at that software this summer. So I'm quite grateful to their efforts. Um, and so what, we're, what we'd like to do is, is have the board adopt the policy now, understanding that because it's new, because we're gonna be rolling out training and new technology in conjunction with the policy, it very well may be that we'll have some minor edits and, and particularly some additional um, implementing procedures that will develop over time. Thank you, Yasmin. Further comments or questions related to the classroom recording policy? Jim. Just to see as the members on screen can see, we couldn't possibly function without Yasmin's help. Thanks, Jim. Okay, all those in favor of uh, the resolution, please say aye. 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 We have approved the classroom recording policy. Thank you. Did we, did we have someone that made the motion and a second on that? Because if we did, I missed it. We yeah. did not. Yeah. <laughs> Could we just Peg, do it again? Peg, do we need somebody? <laughs> yeah, I, I think she missed me making the motion and Jim doing the second. Okay. That was, <laughs> that was on uh, uh, Greg Petrix though, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so we need it separately for the no, classroom okay. policy. We need a new motion and second. On I'm this one. Right. Yeah. right. Thank you. You, you, need, you need to recognize the, or the humor in Peg's comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Always recognized. <laughs> From a long time ago. Okay. 22 years. <laughs> In fact, so do we or do we not need to reconsider that? Yes, we do. Maybe a, a vote. Are you serious? Sophie's saying we do. No. Okay. I'll make the motion. Peg, Peg moved and who seconded? If, if I think Jim. Peg said I did. Okay. 
Uh, and we'll re-vote. Re Given that we have a motion on the floor now and it has been seconded, all those in favor of approving the classroom recording policy, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then we have done so. <laughs> I don't know how it is where you are, but it's getting pretty warm here in the attic. <laughs> yes, likewise. Let's keep moving. Yep. Okay, Yasmin. Uh, well, this one, um, I don't know if individual presidents wanted to speak to this. The EPSL committee certainly heard quite a bit of detail about the planning. Obviously, that's an ongoing uh, work in progress. Um, and I think um, you, probably all the board members have received updates about, about plans at this point of what colleges have announced thus far. Um, so I guess I would turn it over either to our chancellor or the presidents at this point for... Any additional updates? Okay. Uh, Sophie, how do you want to guide us through this? Um, Church, this was something you had requested when we did the EPSL committee meeting. We received um, input from the deans of students from the different colleges, and you had indicated that you wanted to have it brought to the, the full board. Uh, rather than have everybody come back, um, I believe the presidents are willing to just provide a, a quick update um, in terms of where they stand uh, for moving forward. I will say there is work ongoing that our deans of students are involved with, with AVIC, which is the Association for Vermont Independent Colleges, that are putting together um, recommended, recommended guidance uh, that will go to the administration that hopefully will be released by the governor that will, will govern uh, all higher ed uh, for the fall uh, for reopening. Um, so obviously that's taken a lot of work when you have all the different colleges and universities uh, providing input, but but my understanding is that's going to be going shortly uh, to the governor's team, um, and the hope is the governor will issue that uh, soon. But so I just did want to give a shout out to the deans of students who have have been working very very hard on this and and coordinating uh, with their colleagues across the state. Um, but this was something you had requested, and I believe the president uh, can can give you updates as to where things are right now. Just a little capsule on each, if we could the highlights knowing that uh, things change every week. Jonathan, you, you popped up first in front of me. Thank you. Um, so at Caston, uh, employees were invited to return to campus this week. Uh, those who wanted to continue working from home were allowed to do so. Uh, but starting next month, the default mode is that Employees are back on campus with, of course, accommodations for those with personal or medical issues that prevent them from coming to campus. Uh, as to students, many of you know that to protect public health, um, we really can't allow our students to go home for breaks and then return back to campus. So we're going to start the fall semester one week early, that's August 18th, eliminate the week long fall break in October, and then end the semester at Thanksgiving and send the students home. So it's a way to get in the full 15 weeks of instruction uh, and still protect public health. As far as the health protocols that will be in place in the fall, we are still working around the clock, seven days a week to cover all contingencies. Uh, we are anxious for the governor to um, issue his long promised and long awaited guidelines for higher ed. Uh, and as soon as that's done, we will all make our decisions and make our purchases. Um, <coughs> and that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, similar to Castleton, uh, we are going to be uh, foregoing the October break and sending our students home after Thanksgiving to finish the semester online. However, we are starting at the regular date on August 24th. We're bringing our out-of-state students in a week early. Um, current guidance is they either need to quarantine for two weeks or we need to have them for a week and test them. Uh, we are working with Gifford Hospital on doing testing and God bless them, they have grant funds to cover that cost. So they're willing to do that for us uh, pro bono, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, we are working on our opening plans as um, Jonathan pointed out for Castleton, it's still the ground still moving a little bit in terms of what we're hearing from uh, the, the governor and it may be a few weeks. So we're gonna start putting things on paper and disseminating to the community knowing that 
things are going to have to change. Uh, faculty are working on classroom and lab plans, which is good. Um, so we will be screening all employees every day. We've ordered masks for students and employees. We're doing plexiglass everywhere you can imagine. Uh, there's a new negative air system we're having to buy for our dental hygiene lab. Um, and then, of course, we'll be social distancing wherever and however possible. And then having plan B, be ready to pivot to remote delivery, potentially at a moment's notice. Um, the other challenge is finding quarantine and isolation space. Um, the guidance from the governor's office seems to be pointing at up to 5% of, uh, or 15%, I think it is, of the population that you have to be prepared to isolate students. That's going to be particularly tricky for out-of-state students. If they're ill, they can't get on a plane or a train. So uh, we're going to have to provide opportunities for them to stay here. So <clears throat> all this is in progress. It's particularly tricky, as I'm sure Elaine knows. Uh, and Joyce with two campuses and multiple sites. Uh, solutions are easier in some places than others. So that's the update from Vermont Tech. Thank you, Pat. Any questions for Pat? This is big stuff, people. Elaine. So at um, NBU, many of the same decisions have been made. Similar to Castleton, we've decided to start the semester on the 18th. We will forego the October break uh, allow students to go home during that Thanksgiving holiday and then uh, finish the semester by doing their finals in a remote fashion. Uh, still a lot of unanswered questions. As Sophie was mentioning, we're working closely with AVEC and waiting for the governor's um, guidelines as well. On campus, we have three teams working together, the executive team, emergency management team, and the residential planning team. Uh, and we're working together with two hospitals, uh, for Johnson Copley Hospital and for Linden Northeastern Vermont Regional. We're planning with uh, three scenarios in mind, returning to campus for fall, that's our hope, uh, under strict conditions and possible you know, alterations. Uh, a second scenario would be having a remote fall, so fully remote fall, and then the third scenario, fully remote year. Um, the only other thing that I think has not been mentioned already, so we have the same kinds of challenges in terms of isolation, housing, and all the new expectations, PPE, all those kinds of things, uh, outbreak response, athletics. I, I think the only other uh, interesting point to note is to note for uh, NBU is that we are intending to uh, continue to, you know, keep our students as safe as possible by providing only single rooms for all of our residential students. So that's our report. Thank you, Elaine. Any questions for President Collins? Okay, President Judy. Um, yes, and we made, we've made we made some changes and we announced this to the college community yesterday. Um, we've decided that we, we needed, because there's so, so much uncertainty in the environment, we decided that we wanted to make sure that no matter what we were rolling out for fall, we could deliver, no matter what, the, what happens with um, the COVID-19 situation. So we, um, 332 of our, on, our classes for fall are online. They will go as scheduled. And then we took and looked at all of our on-ground classes and we're offering them in three different formats. Um, one, and we really are trying to find a silver lining in this situation so that we can also be trying out some different formats. So we are moving a significant number of courses to what we're calling synchronous, which is a combination. It's online, but then there's also a synchronous component of it. So students, no matter where they are, can they'll have a class, they'll have a quote unquote classroom experience, but it won't be on ground. They will, so if I sign up for English composition on Mondays, I may, from six to eight, I will meet a certain number of Mondays from six to eight synchronously with the rest of my class online, but it will be totally online. So it's a, our synchronous classes will be a hybrid of traditional online, but also um, a chance to um, have a classroom experience, but it will be on online. And um, that, um, you know, other colleges have been doing it. And I believe this is the format, a significant format that we will be adopting and using um, far into the future. 
Second, we are offering some hybrid classes, which are both online and on ground, particularly for those lab science courses and other courses that are pretty impossible to stage online. So online, um, lab studio arts, those kind of courses will have an on-ground component and an online component. Um, and then the third, we are taking and moving a lot more of our on-ground courses to online. So we are really trying to limit the amount of on-ground activity we have in our centers because we, we, our students and faculty, and we did this in consultation with our our faculty union because you know so many <laughs> faculty and students have expressed concern about coming back into class and so how can we um, make sure that we are attentive to that and also um, being able to offer the most robust um, educational experience we can so that's <laughs> been our change and I sent out the letter yesterday to get sort of the ball rolling because we have to reach out to faculty and students who are um, who are impacted, and I have to say, the number of response, positive responses I've gotten back from from faculty has been um, tremendous. So we're pretty happy with how we're rolling it out. There will be bumps, but um, we will have a limited number of students and faculty in our centers for the fall, as a traditional 15-week, three-hour class. Thank you, Joyce. Thoughts or questions for Joyce? and they have been incredibly well received. And so we are moving almost probably close to 100 of our classes are gonna be offered in this synchronous format. And students and faculty are loving it because it gets, they have a chance to have a, be tight and hear from faculty. Um, it, it can, they can do lecture, they can have, it allows for a highly interactive um, session, but they don't have to come into a, they don't have to physically come into a center. So we think, this is gonna be a pretty popular format going forward. And, and the COVID-19 has forced us to get more aggressive with this. So, so we're trying to just make sure we are using this as a chance to also propel us forward instead of being just reactive. We're trying to be a little proactive in this. All the more reason to do everything we can to lend our support to efforts to bring broadband truly to every household yeah. in Vermont. Because I can imagine the more we move in that direction, the more difficult it's going to be for some of our students. That's, and the one other thing I will say is we are, we are doing a tremendous amount of faculty training because it's not, we are, we are, it's not just taking what you do on ground and moving it online. So if faculty are teaching in the synchronous format, they have to go through a training. We are requiring that. And we've been, we are so thrilled with the partnership we have with our faculty union because they are right there with us in support. Thank you. Anything further on uh, the current nature of plans for returning students and plans for the fall semester? Karen. Uh, just two points of clarification. <clears throat> um, I might have been off and not paying as close attention as I should have been. Um, so I apologize if, if I'm asking redundant question. Um, one of the colleges mentioned that the, the housing would be single rooms only. What's the status of that situation across the board on all our campuses? A quick answer for Karen. Pat? Uh, we are going to try to attempt that, Karen, but if it may result in us having to turn students away, so we're quite nervous about that. So we may end up having to double up folks, particularly to try to accommodate um, isolation space. So we're gonna see where the enrollment ends up and, and proceed accordingly. Thank you. Jonathan? We are in the um, fortunate and unfortunate situation of having too many students to have singles. So uh, we are doubling up. And of course that means massive intensive safety, health, and cleaning protocols uh, will be in place. Okay. I'm looking for Elaine. I have a second question. And this is across the board to everybody except um, CCV. Um, 
Joyce mentioned that CCV has really stepped up the efforts to train teachers um, to be able to accommodate the new teaching modalities, beef that up, um, what's happening across the board with that. I'll, I'll respond first because I, I didn't respond to the last uh, question. So I was the one that had the single room. So that's why I didn't respond, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, re with respect to helping faculty uh, succeed in terms of their instruction, we at NBU through our Center for Teaching and Learning have provided access to uh, coursework that would help faculty become stronger in terms of their remote uh, instruction in preparation for the fall semester. So uh, we're excited that faculty have really been, you know, moving toward taking this, uh, these types of professional development opportunities. And um, even to the point where some part-time faculty are asking to uh, have access to these types of opportunities, which I, I would support as well. Thank you. Pat? Um, we are doing a lot of work this summer with various faculty groups to create coaches and mentors with other faculty. So we've got our Canvas coaches and an expanded uh, number of those. And there's a concerted effort by Anna Gayette, our academic dean, and Kelly Campbell, our um, chief technology officer, to work with these faculty groups over the summer and faculty generally um, to help them get more proficient in remote delivery. Uh, we also plan on using a fair amount of our COVID money to help with that training, as well as deploying additional resources uh, so we can be much better at it. We're outfitting more labs and classrooms with better technology for asynchronous um, delivery and or synchronous delivery, um, again, as part of the plan to pivot. So um, we don't have a center like NBU has, but we've got a lot of very dedicated folks who are working and mentoring their peers. Okay. Anything to add, Jonathan? Uh, the same, we have a massive ongoing training regimen this summer led by faculty on how to teach online, uh, many workshops, um, uh, and uh, it's paid for by partly by with COVID money and fortuitously, we have a new Title III grant and the feds have allowed us to repurpose some of that money toward training this summer. So our faculty have, the participation is amazing. They've really stepped up, given of their time in the summer and uh, just could not be happier about that. Thank you. Karen? Um, I, I commend all the presidents and, and our faculty on on being proactive because we don't know where we're gonna land. Everybody's aware of that. And I'd also like to commend, and I apologize, I don't recall the name of the very impressive um, person who gave testimony um, from VTC staff member, professor who gave testimony at a Senate hearing a week or so back, maybe two weeks back about remote learning and education and things that were happening on ETC. It was very impressive and I uh, was particularly proud of um, the input. Thank you, Karen. Okay, Jim and Yasmin, is that it for EPSL? Thank you. And thank you for the updates on the fall. I mean, every, well, I guess I'd say three, three days a week Many of us, you know, can't walk through the house without hearing uh, the live press conference and uh, watching everything unfold. So it's good for us to know. We now move to long range planning. Uh, and speaking of being on our television sets at home three times a week, or you're not there every day, Michael, but um, uh, Michael, are you available? It looks like he has dropped off. Yeah, I think he had he had meetings this afternoon. He was going to okay. step in and out. So I. And so I, Sophie, can you can you lead us through this? Um, this was again just a follow up from the long range planning committee meeting that we had. Um, each of the college presidents had reported back on on what they were doing to the long range planning committee, and the thought was that it would be beneficial for the the whole board to hear 
what's been happening at the individual colleges. And of course, time has elapsed in the past couple of weeks and a lot of stuff is happening. So um, I think we'll just go to each president in turn, starting with uh, Elaine at NVU for an update on where things stand with the uh, NVU Strong Advisory Committee and anything else that's happening uh, pertaining to the Long Range Planning Committee. So today we just gave the final update uh, for this long range planning, or I'm sorry, for this uh, NVU Strong Committee. Uh, the team was made up of 17 members. It was chaired by Provost uh, Atkins, and we, we uh, invited members of the community to serve in it. Uh, we had one alum community member as well, staff, faculty, and students. So that comprised, um, we had four of each. Uh, each category. And um, their charge was to find us a sustainable or build, help us build and, and think of a sustainable model uh, for the future that would enable us to move into uh, future challenges that we know are coming, such as the demographic challenges that we're expecting uh, second wave in 2026. Uh, and also to identify areas for uh, budget reduction as well as uh, revenue generation. And so uh, that is what's the charge. Uh, as we proceeded through the process uh, and the meetings, uh, what we soon came to realize is that a significant part of our work would be impacted by the VSC future uh, VSC, whatever the committee there is, I'm running out of, I, I can't remember all the names, um, committee that is looking at making systems recommendations. So for instance, um, if we could uh, reduce the duplication and the competition, that would help us achieve certain budget goals in that respect, okay? If we decided on one gen ed to be utilized across the system, that would be another way that we could reduce tuition and that we could um, create a system-wide effort. And I think that's consistent with what was reported uh, related to Jim Page's findings and um, what he was recommending. So some of our work is, is still kind of pending uh, the recommendations that will come out of that committee. But I can tell you that um, if you access northernvermont.edu slash strong future, so I'll say it again, northernvermont.edu slash strong future, you can uh, find the details because my report is not going to go into the details of every single recommendation that this committee came up with, but I think it's worth a review. I think you'll find it interesting. I could not be happier with the recommendations that came out of this committee. These were the 17 most dedicated people I've ever met. I mean, they worked tirelessly, uh, had really hard discussions, and I think came up with a winning uh, proposal. And so I'm here to talk about this today. So uh, what I can tell you is that the first, the first uh, challenge was to kind of wrap their minds around the all the recommendations that were coming out of the community. Because as you remember, the legislators were having fora in our communities to discuss um, what they thought NVU needed to do. We had community members, former alums, uh, having their own discussion. There are all types of groups right now that are, are working together to come up with good ideas and contributions. So uh, the committee actually reviewed every single idea and tried to group them into themes that were coming out and then would consider uh, the ones that had kind of the most um, thematic uh, repetition and they brought those to the table for further discussion. Uh, the model that they have come up with is I think also not only was it grounded in the themes emanating from the community discourse but it's also grounded in research, all right? And it's coming out of a, a study that we had commissioned through EduVentures. And what they did was look at uh, NVU and also 90 of our peers and compared us and um, really, really urged us to uh, pivot away from more of a traditional type of model of higher education into something where we could really identify unique niche and uh, kind of rethink the business model. So that is kind of the approach that we took. 
out of this, the two most amazing contributions from my perspective are first, uh, the vision that has come out of this com committee, and that is to create a learning and working community, all right, to become a learning and working community. And uh, what you see up here are kind of the main points uh, of this community, but I'll just kind of speak broadly uh, around some of the ideas here. What we're trying to do is to really create stronger pathways between our academic degree programs and uh, career goals for students. So we want to ensure that during their course of study, students would have access to integrated work experience, work experiences. Uh, we're doing this by, by tying into key industry sectors. And in a few minutes, uh, after I discuss this, we'll put up another slide that kind of will give you a sense of uh, 25 industries, organizations, nonprofits that we've contacted that have given us um, kind of a statement of interest. They would like to pursue this model further with us to see how their organization can fit. So uh, we anticipate that we will have a much closer relationship with these key industry sectors. Uh, what this will do for students is provide them much more of a uh, flexible education in that we will be providing certificates and degrees and it will allow them on ramps and off ramps so that they can access their education as they see fit. Um, the other, so three, I think, interesting pieces of this model and you might say, well, haven't you really had a strong relationship with your industry partners? Haven't you done this before? What I can tell you is that we've had informal relationships with our industry partners, but we really want to have deep and formalized relationships. For instance, when we met with some of our um, industry partners to just kind of uh, bounce this idea around, what they said is that they would like even more intensive internships that would allow students to truly function as a potential employee and less as a student. So that means like foregoing spring break and operating more as an employee of that organization. Uh, they brought up the model of student teaching as a model that they would like to kind of think about. So it would be perhaps an internship that might span two semesters instead of one. So that would be one form of this uh, partnership that we really don't have at this point. The second, uh, and, and I can say this too, uh, even if we do have it in certain areas, we don't have it across the board. So this would be a real widespread effort across every single uh, program of study that we uh, offer to have this kind of tight relationship with an industry partner. The second piece is to offer more co cooperative learning experiences. So in this case, uh, we could potentially send students out to uh, work in a company. So in, in one industry, for example, they're hiring our students out before they can even finish their degrees. So why can't we uh, make an agreement with that industry to say, all right, maybe in your low season, we can uh, have the students come back to school and, and work on their degrees. And given that the degrees are more flexible, this will work. And then in your high season, they will serve as um, interns in your organization. So that's um, a cooperative learning model that we're looking at. And the third, um, the third piece that truly makes this a unique model is that, and, and addresses the issue of footprint, because my understanding is that that was a, a strong concern that our footprint is too large for the number of students that we currently have. Uh, what we saw is the co-location of our partners on campus. And there, um, there are already a number of partners that have expressed interest and they are speaking with our Dean of Administration at this point to determine, um, to at least share how much square footage they're interested in leasing, uh, how that will work for their organization. And then we will be creating criteria for these partners uh, so that they can come in and make sure that they're served well and would have access to all the resources um, that are available on campus. So that's essentially a, um, a large kind of overview of what we are intending to offer. Um, what I can tell you about this, and, and again, to try to answer the question, 
um, you know, so well, how, how, do, how do you see this really helping you to move toward a balanced budget? As I mentioned, uh, we have, we, our goal is in this next coming year, we're going to continue the work that we started through unification in terms of streamlining our services and bringing our departments together. And that work is uh, ongoing and you know, I think it's in good shape. So we're going to continue through that work that will help. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the work that we're doing with uh, at the system level, that also gives us a lot of um, opportunities. And lastly, uh, we've been working and engaging in a uh, process for program review. So depending on the organizations that we will uh, end up hosting, uh, we would like to create a very strong partnership with the programs that would remain on campus uh, and then have conversations perhaps to close low enrolled programs, possibly combine programs across Linden and Johnson where needed and or um, move other programs to uh, perhaps other institutions where that would make sense in the VSC. All right, so um, just some thoughts and maybe at this time it might be helpful to give you a sense of some of the partners so that you would um, you could see and this essentially gives all of the signatures of the partners who have signed on uh, to begin and this is this isn't like even a comprehensive list because there are a lot of partners that we currently have that we these are kind of partners that we may not have worked with in the past that are very interested in this particular idea and um, continuing to help us uh, achieve long-term sustainability for NVU. Uh, but what I think also this model will do for us is I think it offers new grant opportunities and relationships with businesses that we might not have had before. I think, uh, as I mentioned before, and as you know, through um, the discussion that we had uh, through in yesterday's meeting, we are in the active process of selling some properties that are not utilized and or leasing facilities. And so that will continue. I think it opens up opportunities with uh, our existing donors as well as new donors. And we've already had very promising uh, conversations and um, kind of exciting amounts that, that people are thinking about uh, dedicating to this particular effort. And I think, uh, you know, ultimately, and I don't know, you know, this is going to require time as Jim Page said, you know, for NVU, we, we do need time to make this all work. But um, my hope is that as we identify our key industries, um, some of these industries have already pledged that they would start marketing on a national front for us. And if we can do that, and if we become the professional development provider for those key industries in the Northern tier, all right, and they're, they're uh, advertising nationally, then we have a very strong opportunity to recruit um, students that might not have thought about us before that, if we are known as the kind of industry expert uh, that will kind of ensure that they will have a smooth pathway into um, a, a, a career in that particular industry. And then lastly, I think it offers us a great opportunities, as I mentioned, for more non-credit uh, certificate kind of work through our Center for Professional Studies, as well as um, for NVU Online for credit work. So I'll stop there uh, to see if you have any questions. And you have a full packet, I believe, of materials, and it will give you uh, more of, of uh, the uh, vision. I think there's a two-page description of the vision and some other recommendations I didn't include. Like I said, I'd really urge you to go back to the website and you'll see every single recommendation. We're already acting on some of the recommendations that have been, um, that you will find there. So they're already in process. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you very much. And to everyone that worked on the NVU Strong Initiative. Thoughts and questions for uh, President Collins. Uh, just a comment, President Collins. Um, it's great energy, great ideas, great springboard. And I'll be very interested to see how all this information 
and energy feeds into the larger, how it coalesces with the other task force forces and, and then feeds into the systemic. Um, it's impressive and thank you so much. And I know you've got your heart and soul in this. And I did, I did send Elaine, I kind of teased her, I saw her on TV and I said, uh, star st stage and screen now um, with a great ad um, uplifting our recent grads. So that that's all good. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Hey, yeah, this is Janet. Um, Elaine, so it is, it's really impressive and I think it's a great approach. Have you, have you or the team given much thought as to how you're going to move from this into an implementation plan? Will you pick one group to work with or one particular program? You know, sometimes you got to shake it all out, um, even a great idea. And so I'm curious to understand how you'll flip from the big idea to the it's starting to make it happen. Yes, exactly. And and um, like I said, we've already kind of um, started working on the low hanging fruit and try to you know um, dispatch those recommendations out and get them moving. And some of them are, but the ones that are more complex, uh, our provost and I and the executive team were already talking about form forming small groups to start working on uh, creating the implementation phases or the, the next uh, set of uh, tasks that need to be done so that we can get this moving. So um, that will be the work of the next few weeks. Okay. Sophie, where should we go from here? I think we have VTC next on the agenda. Okay. Pat? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I will share you one with one PowerPoint slide with you in a minute. Um, but we have a transition advisory task force that's been working for a month now. It's comprised of faculty, staff, and students. Uh, there's also representation from all our collective bargaining units on that group. Ryan Cooney, who is with you, is, is part of that advisory group. So he is a busy man this summer. Um, the role of that group is to advise the president and the executive committee and a drafting team. We have put together a drafting team of six who are members of the transition advisory team or task force who will actually be putting all the ideas together into a proposal. But the role of this group is to advise me and the, and the drafting team on vetting ideas that have come to us, advising on goals for our final plan, advise on public process and communication plan and assure transparency review all our proposed plans and communicate out to their peers and bring information back. Uh, we had, a, had I'll put in past tense, a deadline of July 1st. We've, that's crept out a little bit to July 13th, 15th right now to facilitate that appropriate transparency and feedback. I would like to share one uh, slide, an outcome, because the, the group has come up with some great mes metrics thus far for um, what the plan should look like post uh, in, its, in its final stages. And those are that the college operating budget will achieve, can you see that by the way? Okay, yep. will achieve a 5% operating margin annually. That will assure that we have adequate resources to put into reserves and capital costs such as IT and facilities. So that's important. Um, timeline on getting there to be determined. <clears throat> that we will increase, that will have return on educa educational investment will increase by a certain percentage to be determined through cost reductions and enhanced graduate outcomes. We've been looking a lot at obviously the Georgetown University uh, Center for Workforce Development and Education and their return on investment study and the metrics they're using. Uh, we rate very well in that study now and we wanna hang on to that position, but we wanna increase the return on investment. The third is that we will design all programs for decentralized delivery and access for students, including non-traditional, by the fall of 2021 and implement as feasible. And we have some who are ready to implement that now. Uh, and so we are able to move forward. And part of our planning for the fall is to look at where could we do a combination of face-to-face -face and potentially remote delivery. The last bullet will be a little difficult to measure and we're figuring that out, but levels of graduate education satisfaction, career preparedness and ability to participate in an effective citizenry 
will continue or improve. That's very important that we're not just educating great ex subject matter experts, but we're edu educating good citizens as well. So this is a body of work that the, the group has already come up with, which I am very pleased at, at the amount that they've come to these conclusions. They've also vetted over close to 500 suggestions that have been submitted to us. Suggestions from the college community, the Randolph community. We even called the Idea Bank at the legislature to see what might be pertinent to Vermont Tech. As with NVU, we've broken those into four basic theme areas. They include academics and delivery as one, recruitment, enrollment, student life is another theme group. The third group is campuses, VSC reorganization and administration. And the last group is costs, revenue, and tuition and funding. And there are different members of the TNT, TAT on each of these groups. And they've gone through and put all these suggestions into themes and then have ranked all the suggestions as red, yellow, green, needs more research, already in progress things such as that. Um, they are at the point now where we have presented, actually we made a presentation to the college community just before this meeting this afternoon to update them on where we are at. And the TAT will be doing some additional work, uh, researching, vetting, and then they'll be forwarding those ideas on to the drafting team so we can begin our work, <coughs> excuse me, while they continue their work. Simultaneous to the TAT committee, another thing I'm very excited about is we've started an agriculture and food systems transformation planning project. This is an all-volunteer effort that grew when Ellen Kaler of the Vermont State Sustainable Jobs Fund gave me a call and said she was getting inundated with calls and concern that our Randolph Center campus would close and what that would leave for a gap in agricultural education in the state. So she volunteered to facilitate, God bless Ellen, and for those of you who know her, she's, is, she's as succinct and as well organized as any human I've ever met. Um, she is sort of the mother of uh, the farm to plate movement, if you will, in Vermont and contracted with the legislature to do that. But she has also selected Louise Calderwood, who is the director of regulatory affairs for the American Feed Industry Association and a former deputy secretary of agriculture and a former faculty member <clears throat> to serve as a voluntary co-chair along with Regina Beidler, who is of the Beidler Farm here in Randolph Center, and she also works for Organic, for Organic Valley in their crop cooperative. They are our co-chairs. <clears throat> These three ladies get stuff done in a pace that I haven't seen in a long time, which is a beautiful thing. They are also bringing in working teams of volunteers, ag folks from around the state, the goal is to identify the educational niche we can own in the agriculture and food systems arenas. <coughs> Excuse me, this is not COVID, this is allergy. I apologize. So when we develop that niche and find that place we can own, our outcome will be a business plan that will talk about how we can move forward, the financing, the cash flow, the investment, et cetera. <laughs> I'm excited that this larger group of volunteers will have ownership in this project and will really help us obtain the financing we need to really implement. <clears throat> Those are on, <clears throat> sorry, somewhat simultaneous tracks. The TAT hopes to have their work done. So what we have called, what I'm calling sort of the skeleton of the proposal done by July 15th, but then we'll have an implementation plan we have to develop going forward best example I can give is let's say one of the recommendations is that we form close partnerships with CTE and have them serve as, as labs for us. Well, the implementation will be what CTEs, what programs, to execute those agreements, et cetera. So there is a body of work that will go on after. The ag process is on a six to nine month process. We're hoping our plan can be a little shorter, but we also think that could, these, these times dovetail nicely with the system-wide transition plan. So um, we are moving forward with attempting to dispose of some property. We've got some interest in our enterprise center and some folks poking around on the Red Schoolhouse, which I've learned we own the building, but we lease the land and there are restrictions on that, but um, that is moving us forward. We are also continuing to work on partnering with CCV <clears throat> on shared services of some type. Uh, Lit Tyler and Andy Polito have been meeting and discussing that along with the thousand other things they're doing. So uh, progress may not be moving quite as fast as uh, we might like to see, but uh, we're all, I've got a lot of balls in the air, but we are moving forward on this. And 
as with NVU, this is going to take time. Uh, we're not going to liquidate assets and, and fill up buildings right away. Uh, but I'm excited by the energy the faculty have put into this and the college community. The faculty is really um, excited about looking at new modalities for delivery and, and, and making low res and um, access for non-traditional students a priority. It's, it's exciting to see that the whole college community is engaged. Um, and I'm, I'm just excited about what the outcome is going to look like. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, President Moulton. It's been busy in the hills of Randolph and the plains of Williston as well. Yes. Any thoughts and questions for this update? Okay. Exciting. It's all exciting. Thank you, Karen. Moving on to uh, President Spiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a busy time on the banks of the Caston River as well. Um, uh, the magnificent Caston River, which you only see after a very big rain, but still. Uh, <laughs> we do not have a long range task force. Uh, instead, we have 16 committees comprised of over 100 faculty and staff working on the thousands of details we need to have in place in order to open up in the fall. Um, and as long as I have the spotlight, I'm compelled to state that we are very grateful to the legislature for giving us the help they have with perhaps even more on the way in order to make the fall even possible. That support is absolutely critical. Um, speaking of critical, I'd like to give you just a quick update on enrollment. Two statistics, campus visits. This is visits from high school seniors who are college shopping. Uh, those are down 47% at Castleton this year. Um, for the, I think, obvious reason that we closed our campus halfway through the semester. Um, so the more important statistic at this point is deposits. And deposits from first year students are down, but down just 6%. Uh, I think that's kind of a stunning figure at a time when polling reveals that many students are thinking about foregoing college in the fall uh, due to health concerns, due to the recession, due to the fear that we might convert to wholly online instruction. Uh, also, uh, some of our competitors are desperately trying to woo our students by offering up to 70, 70% in tuition discounts. Uh, nonetheless, I think uh, that's a positive snapshot of our enrollment with the caveat that a lot could happen between now and August. As the great Betty Davis once said, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy summer. And I will stop there. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Linda. Um, thoughts on how Vermont's COVID situation, numbers of cases, that sort of thing is actually very awfully good compared to states around us. Is that having a uh, impact, a benefit you think on those? Numbers. What a great question. If I say it's a great question, it means I know what the answer is. So thank you for asking the question. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we have a marketing campaign uh, <clears throat> whose theme is stay home and stay safe. And uh, Vermont in general and Rutland in particular have the uh, lowest infection rates in the nation. And so we are encouraging not just uh, students from urban centers to come to Vermont, get educated and be safe, but even uh, Vermont students who currently go out of state for college, uh, we are encouraging them to come home for at least a year, be safe, be with your family and get your education in the VSCS. Um, uh, it, it's a great, marketing opportunity, Linda, that Vermont is safe and healthy and athletic and active and what a great place to be during these very troubled times. So thank you for asking. 
that's why we're all here. That's why I'm here. Yeah, very good. Okay, President Judy. And if I unmuted, you could actually hear me. Wonders never cease. So um, I don't have a lot more to add. Um, I think that you've heard CCV sort of sprinkled um, throughout each of the plans. And I think that um, our work is how do, we, how do we engage with each of those the three um, planning processes as they get further down the road. I think the places that, that um, are most important for us are the pathways between CCV and, the, and those other institutions because we, can, we are a feeder. Um, and the more the more clear and um, and very focused pathways are really helpful, and so I think that that's something that we're working hard on. I think that a couple um, really specific things. I think that we're also looking at are there ways um, for the Hartness Library, that is CCV and Vermont Tech's library, to be more um, to to broaden to support. Um, the library um, services of the system that will that's going to be uh, something we're definitely exploring with other schools. I think Pat mentioned to you um, that um, Lit and Andy, our two deans of administration, are working hard on a plan around um, administrative operations and really thinking about how the two of us um, can think about those um, in some ways that perhaps we haven't um, thought about. And then I think the final thing I would just say is I think that, um, you know, as I mentioned, when we talked about our fall plan for us, um, you know, as we look to the future, we have got to get pretty creative about um, how do we make sure that we are offering courses and programs in the ways that people want to access them. So things like the synchronous format, um, our flex program, which we just um, received funding from the Northfield Savings Bank um, to really, we've, We've offered a few um, flex programs in the spring um, and we will be going full tilt ahead in the fall around that. And, and just to remind you, flex means that students can, there are five different enrollment periods when an adult, a student can enroll during those. All, the, all of them have to end at the same time, but you can um, register and take it, oh, spread that course over 15 weeks or you could spread it over seven weeks and you get to choose and it's, um, it's a it's a very much of a self-paced program, but with a tremendous interaction with a faculty member. So um, you know that's um, our work is really thinking about how do we make sure that we are, you know, um, the traditional once a week for fifteen weeks for community college students is going to become less and less of the the common format. People want it in really different ways. So our challenge is how do we make sure we're staying on on top of that and offering courses and programs in the format um, that that um, the public wants. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take take questions. Right. Linda? Probably too early to see an impact from the McClure Foundation offer of uh, one course to every 2020 graduate. I can tell you we've had hundreds of inquiries. So the, the first step for this group is they have to fill out a very simple inquiry form and we've um, literally had hundreds of inquiries. So that's a very good step. And so we'll um, see how they how it materializes over the time. But I think this um, what Jonathan was saying, the stay home, stay safe. I think for people who I think we're going to see more and more students who were thinking of going out of state take a gap year. And how do we how do we as a system um, capitalize that on that and maybe perhaps they won't leave the state for that institution maybe maybe do their whole bachelor's program um, in Vermont but um, we're trying to make sure that we are there for um, that population especially yeah, I would think especially even if it's a gap semester yeah if uh, graduating seniors can incorporate uh, a free course at CCV into their gap gap semester or gap year, yeah, it'll be time well spent. And who knows where 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 that will lead to? That's right. Yep. Yeah. Thoughts and questions for President Judy. Uh, yeah, this is Janet again. Um, so I'm gonna 
probably bring up the thing I bring up every time in these meetings, which is, um, you know how important I think the work um, that's going on between VTC and CCV is on the, I'll call it the back office. Yeah. And um, I'm concerned actually at all of the colleges that the hard, hard part of everything is not the good idea. The hard part is flipping it into action. Yep. Um, and anything can get in the way, right? It can be emotions, it can be project management, you know, there's a hundred reasons. And so I guess what I'm asking is, are, are you, and Pat, you can answer too if you want, um, is do you feel that work that those guys are doing is turning into action or is it still stuck in analysis? Cause it should move on by now. Um, Jan, I will just say it's not stuck in analysis. I think because if you know Andy and Lit, if you spent any time with Andy and Lit, they don't spend a lot of time. Well, I can just say for Andy, Andy doesn't spend a whole lot of time wallowing around in analysis. I mean, he looks at it, he's, but I think that, um, I think we just have to be um, very strategic as we move forward. And I would be happy to talk with you in really specific terms um, offline. Um, I think that, um, and I think maybe Pat and I could sometime give you, give you an update on sort of some of the thinking, but the other, you know, I think we also need to be mindful. We don't want to get ahead of some of the other work that's happening, but I'm happy to share with you in really specific detail, some of the things that we actually are thinking about, but it's a lot of, I would say that it's a lot of work in our business op office operations and really thinking about how we could do that, um, collectively in ways that we haven't thought about it before. No, I hold both those guys in extremely high regard in it. And I've, I've felt that if, if any pair of people were gonna pull something off, it was gonna be those two. Um, so that's why I'm just very um, <clears throat> mindful of where they're at in this process, because if those two can't push implementation of change, it doesn't, and I'm just gonna be honest, it doesn't bode well for change anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and Jana, I would just add too that your, your point about implementation is spot on. And, and one of the things that we're evaluating is, okay, we come up with the good ideas and when we implement, will it be enough? Um, and so having conversations about, you know, do we want to set the goalposts in terms of got to cut X in costs and generate Y in revenue and, and really measure against that? I mean, we have the measure of 5% uh, net positive operating budget, but you know, when we evaluate each option, each option, we've got to, we've got to know that it's going to make a difference. And, you know, like Joyce said, I think the opportunity to work on business operations is, is considerable. Um, but that's got to be strategic and evaluated. And, and I know you've offered to help and there probably will be a time when we need that help. Okay. Thank you. Sophie and Michael, anything to add to this part of the agenda today? Um, I had touched on before just the Vermont State College uh, system-wide task force uh, VSCS forward. Uh, Yasmin uh, Ziesler is chairing that. Um, again, it looks like we have an absolutely great group of people. We've had some very constructive conversations. We've met twice. Uh, we have an external facilitator called Elise. I'm probably gonna say it incorrectly, Anis. Um, who's assisting us. Uh, we had the first meeting with her uh, this week. Um, so, and we will be receiving, or we have received um, information from both the NVU and the VTC task forces of things that they want the system-wide task force to look at. Um, as as uh, I think Elaine had noted, there were things that uh, their, their group realized these really need to be a bigger conversation happening at the system level. So that work is is underway and uh, we're in the process of trying to schedule more meetings, which I'm sure as everyone can appreciate can be really challenging when you have 15, 16 people uh, and their different calendars to to work mm -hmm. on. But we are we are moving forward with that. Okay. So let's see, Michael, if I understand your schedule, your next major meeting is going to be uh, July 23rd. Yes. Okay, so much going on and we could devote an entire board meeting just to these uh, <clears throat> important updates. Mr. Chair. Yes. 
Can I just, I just add, I just was trying to pull something up. I found it uh, just to mention that uh, the University of Vermont is also uh, trying to have people study at home. Uh, Front Porch Forum, which many of you participate in your local community. Uh, study closer at home at UVM, apply by June 30th. There are ads being run, uh, paid ads being run by the university on Front Porch Forum to do the same kind of encouragement. And so um, I think we're on the same page and uh, have, have the right idea, but we also have some in-state in uh, folks who are also competing for the same group of students. Absolutely. The chair of the board at St. Michael's College is a long-standing good friend of mine. And he laughingly told me the other day, you know, church, I love you, but we're out to poach every one of the students that are heading your ways that we can. And I said, yep, and we're going to do the same with yours. Okay. Anything else on this agenda item? Then let's just take a quick look at the remaining items on the agenda. We are going to uh, act on a couple of resolutions now. We'll accept comments from the public, determine whether there's any other business, then the board is going to go into executive session. That will involve unplugging from this Zoom session and going into another. Uh, following an executive session, which we will keep as expeditious as we can, the board plans to come out of executive connect a session, reconnect to this Zoom address to engage in some board training, after which we anticipate um, uh, resigning. So there will be a bit of a opportunity as we transition in a few moments to an executive session to tend to vital functions and cool drinks and things like that, and then we'll get back together quickly. But as for the um, what's, what's been agended as consideration of additional resolutions, I would like to take uh, uh, the, the floor and move the following resolution. And I could, if I could ask us that uh, we find Steve Woslowski and bring him on the screen, please. There he is. Remember the, I, I always kept to be, whenever I used to I say, remember the old, I realize I'm the only one who does, but remember the old one, this is your life. And where they would take somebody and over the next half hour, they would just start at, with the kindergarten teacher and go all the way through about some, some celebrity. Well, for the last four and a half years, Steve Waslowski, this is your life. This is a resolution honoring the services of Stephen T. Wislowski. Whereas <clears throat> Stephen T. Wislowski has for four and a half years ably executed the duties prescribed for the chief financial officer of the Vermont State College's system, those being set by statute to supervise and direct the financial and business affairs of the system including the responsibility for keeping books of account, preparation of budgets, receiving, depositing, withdrawing of monies, investing of funds, and making payments on contracts. Whereas, during his tenure, Steve has overseen over $800 million in financial activity for the last 15 years, 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. He has exercised responsibility for a $25 million endowment investment portfolio and for VSC buildings and other capital assets with an acquisition value in, uh, of exceeding a third of a billion dollars. Whereas the Vermont State College's system has benefited greatly from his extraordinary skills in treasury operations particularly in debt restructuring, bond sales, and cash management. <clears throat> Whereas he herded, led, and supported the members of the Business Affairs Council, advised and cajoled and strived to meet the needs of the Council of Presidents, and has served as a valued senior advisor to the Chancellor and as the fiscal conscience of the Chancellor's senior staff, and whereas Steve has organized roughly 35 meetings of the board's finance and facilities committee, supported a dozen or more meetings of the audit committee, 
and 25 or more regular and special meetings of the full board of trustees, and in the process has produced upwards of 1,700 pages of narrative information and quantitative. <laughs> quantitative <laughs> sorry. Uh, I've counted <laughs> everyone, Steve. <laughs> And whereas Steve has shown remarkable tolerance while enduring over 190 weekly phone calls with the Finance and Facilities Committee Chair, therefore be it resolved that the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees expresses its sincere appreciation to Stephen T. Wislowski for the benefit he has brought to the state of Vermont through his service to the VSC system, to its four colleges and universities, to its hundreds of faculty and staff, and most important, to its many thousands of students. Steve Wislowski, we are proud to be counted among your friends and colleagues. We wish you our very best. Is there a second? Sure. Second. There is a second. Is there any debate on this resolution? No. Here, here. Here, here. <laughs> Absolutely. You have served as well, young man. <laughs> that young. Young man. <laughs> yes, yeah, so who, who said that VSC years are very similar to dog years? <laughs> <laughs> so it was really more like 27 years of service, Steve, but thank you very much. All those in favor of this, oh yes, Lynn, please go ahead. Yes, I also want to commend him for doing this at all at the same time, he was on the South Burlington School Board. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Note that I'm no longer on that board. <laughs> <laughs> Further thoughts or comments? Sincere, th sincere thanks from all around, Steve. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Does anyone dare oppose? <laughs> the resolution is passed. It will be signed and and uh, provided to Steve in a fashion suitable for framing, as they say. I have a second resolution that I would like to, to take the privilege of uh, entering. This is a resolution honoring the service of trustee Margaret Peg Flory. <laughs> Whereas Margaret Peg Flory chose to accept the gubernatorial appointment to the VSC Board of Trustees, as her preferred means of continuing her extended and exemplary career in service to the state of Vermont. Whereas her commitment and con contributions as a member of the board's education personnel, student and student life committee and its finance and facilities committee have strengthened the ability of those committees to achieve their purpose and goals Whereas her diligent efforts have strengthened our board through her willingness to share her broad and deep knowledge, skills, and expertise, including her friendly insistence for following proper procedure. <laughs> Whereas she has ably employed her delightful sense of humor to lighten some of the board's most challenging moments. And whereas her personal life has her personal life experience has exemplified and celebrated the perseverance, success, and contribution of non-traditional students everywhere. Therefore, be it resolved, the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees expresses its sincere appreciation to Margaret Peg Flory for the benefits she has brought to the state of Vermont through her service to the VSC system, to its four colleges and universities, to its hundreds of faculty and staff, and most important, to its many thousands of students. Peg Flory, we are very proud to be counted among your friends and colleagues. We wish you our very, very best. Is there Thank a second? You. Second. Is there discussion? Craig, it's been a pleasure. I'm sure yeah, I'll see you good. around. Church. Yes, Peg. I, it's, it's been enjoyable for me to work in a different environment with folks I've known and worked with for a while. 
And it's been enjoyable to meet so many others on this board. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the resolution as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was unanimous and we thank you both. We've now reached the moment in our agenda for uh, comments from the public and I would turn to uh, those who are organizing our meeting today to let us know uh, who we have with us today who cares to share something with the board. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Yasmin. Um, we have several attendees here in the meeting and I would invite anyone who wants to speak to use the uh, raise hand feature. I see Tyrone Shaw has done so. Um, so Tyrone, the floor is yours. Welcome Tyrone. He's on mute. Not anymore. There, there we go. There I go. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. We're no strangers to each other, as I've appeared um, before you multiple times over the past few years. Today um, is no exception. Uh, we've been allied in a common cause, serving the people of Vermont, by protecting and nurturing the Vermont State Colleges. I remain appreciative of the dedication and sacrifices you have shown. And I'm not here as an adversary, but to deliver a message uh, should you have not heard it. Um, I'm also here with a few asks. I'll keep this as brief as I can. First, there is a matter of broken trust and broken hearts. And I ask that you understand the level of mistrust that many of us at NVU now feel towards this board and towards the office of the chancellor which until last September we had regarded as supportive friends, certainly not as potential execution. We do not believe the former chancellor would have proffered his proposal to remove meaningful access to public higher education in the northern tier of Vermont without some consultation with the theater. So why the broken trust? First was the floated rumor of closing the NVU Linton campus. Secondly, was the former chancellor's proposal to close NVU entirely and the Randolph campus of Vermont Tech. By now, you're aware of the consequences to enrollment, not to mention the public outpouring of dismay and anger around that proposal, all playing out against the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19. Considering the damage done and the need to restore shattered trust, you can make concrete gestures to begin the healing a healing I think we all desire and need. It can begin by unequivocally stating your support for NVU going forward. Such a statement is important not only for the students, staff, faculty, and administration of NVU, but for all the stakeholder communities. We have earned that support in our less than two years of existence, having met every benchmark, done everything that has been asked of us. As further proof, the proposals of our NVU Strong Advisory Committee unveiled a vision today that would radically define, redefine the role of our university within the community, completely restructure academic programs, and provide a doable three-year path to graduation with minimal debt. Two years ago at the trustees' annual retreat at Lake Maury, the chair of this board said, and I'm quoting, we will not let NVU fly into the side of the mountain. We ask, please honor that promise. All of this is fraught for the board, for all of us. Again, I have seen successive chancellors, boards, students, faculty, staff, and administration struggling with severe underfunding of the manifest public good. What does it say about us as a so-called enlightened society when we spend twice as much for corrections as we do for higher education? What does it say about us when we are second to last in the nation in terms of state funding for higher education? You know this only too well. If there is any silver lining to be had, I suspect we share common hopes that the legislature and the people of Vermont will finally understand what decades of underfunding have wrought. That as a result, a way to be found uh, will be found to fund public higher education sustainably, sustainably. And finally, I hope for a radically reimagined public higher education it would provide meaningful access to affordable, high-quality education 
throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you, Tyrone. I certainly, for one, value our ongoing dialogue. I do want to um, share one point of clarification. The proposal that was uh, the source of a great deal of uh, disruption and uh, difficulty over the month of April was never presented to this board, never fully discussed by this board, and no action was taken by this board. That's very important that you and your colleagues understand that. And I hope that the actions, uh, the, the, the sessions that we've just spent during our meeting today will continue to demonstrate this board's commitment to higher education throughout the state, including the areas served by NVU and the value that we place on NVU's leadership and faculty. Uh, anyone else care to respond to Professor uh, Shaw's comments? Thank you. Um, do we have a second person presenting? Mr. Chair, no, no other hands raised at this time. Okay. Is there any other business to come before the board? Then uh, Trustee Dickinson, do you have a resolution that would bring us into executive session? I do. <clears throat> I move the BSC Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1 BSA section 313 subsection A1F for the purpose of receiving confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services and section 313 subsection A1E pending civil litigation to which the BSC is a party because premature general public knowledge of these discussions would place BSC at a substantial disadvantage. It is appropriate for the board to enter executive session. And I further move the board enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313 subsection A2 to discuss negotiating or securing real estate purchase or lease options. 1 VSA section 313 subsection A3 to discuss the employment of a public employee. Along with the member of the board, members of the board present at this meeting and its discretion, the board invites the interim chancellor, the presidents and deans of administration for Vermont Tech and Northern University, Northern Vermont University, and interim general counsel to attend. The board, <clears throat> excuse me, the board may as appropriate and permitted by law take action regarding real estate during this executive session. So moved. There a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of going into executive session, please say aye. 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 Uh, for individuals not mentioned in the resolution who we, we would like to have with us for the executive session and for others watching, again, we will go into executive session for uh, some period of time. We will come out of executive session and immediately go into uh, some board training. You're welcome to stay around and sit with us through, through those training, training sessions, but that, that, that those are our plans for the remainder of the afternoon. So right now I show that it is five after four. Let's uh, take a little break and reconvene an executive session at 4.15, 10 minute break, please. Thank you. <laughs> Sophie, you've got a good crowd here for our training, and everyone is so excited. Yes, good. Never can have too much training. <laughs> yeah, let's get it. Yeah, let's get it over with. <laughs> do, you, no, no. do you have enough without me? Um, yes, um, actually, we do, Pe Peg. We have, we have, um, I can But how long is this going to take? Because really, I have Folks, to be on I have the road at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. I, I, I am going to insist on interrupting. We need to understand that we are being broadcast on YouTube. Thank you. But I need to have a feel for- Well, I'm just saying part. we need to Thank understand- you. Then let's get down we, to this. Where we are. And I'm so not I'm sure happy why to... that's required, but we are there. Okay. We are out of executive session. We took no action in the executive session. 
There is no action to be taken at this time. The board is now moving to its final agenda item labeled training sessions. And we'll turn things over to uh, Sophie and her team. And may I just oh. ask if I can get out since you may, you may I'm tag. no longer going to be on the board. So <laughs> That's, unless you really want to, to, to know this stuff, you're more than welcome to uh, to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, thank you already know. Bye. Right, good luck, Peg. And I'm going to turn it over to Todd. So I will move uh, expeditiously, recognizing that I'm in charge uh, of dinner. But I do want to <laughs> make it clear that these these two trainings are very important. Um, for the board, uh, the first is about our new policy 316, which involves uh, child abuse and neglect and reporting allegations of those, uh, any incidents. And this is a requirement that has come down from our insurer, but it's certainly an area that is extremely important for the colleges and as officers of the colleges, uh, extremely important for the board to both understand and recognize our policy and your duties and obligations under the policy. The second piece of training um, will be a refresher for a lot of uh, board members who have been around a little bit longer. Uh, it'll focus on the fiduciary duties and obligations of the board. Um, I will move through that one a little bit faster because uh, I anticipate the opportunity to delve into it with more depth in September when we also focus on conflict of interest. But it, that was a request from the board to look at fiduciary duty, and so we'll provide that quickly. So if there aren't any questions at the jump, I will share my screen and we'll move into uh, the training on policy 316, which the board approved in December. And I just want to make sure, can everybody see yep. the slides? Mm -hmm. All right. So yep. as I said, this, this policy is new, but it is extremely important. It was precipitated by our insurer, but is certainly something I think we all recognize is extremely important in light of uh, a spate of, of recent events at institutes of higher education, including um, the Larry Nasser uh, scandal at Michigan State and the uh, uh, Jerry Sandusky uh, case at Penn State. So very quickly, an overview of the presentation. I'll be talking about the purpose of the policy. I'll be talking about the scope of the policy and then talking about how we're implementing it and the trainings that go along with it. And I know the board has had an opportunity to read uh, the materials in the packet. The full policy was in the packet. Um, and there were some materials from our insurance company uh, that give a little bit more flavor for why this is so vitally important. Um, and I, I should also add, uh, for those of you who are here, thank you for, for attending. And for those folks uh, who are not here, we will be requesting that those board members go to the live stream recording and watch uh, this presentation as well. And so for those folks who are joining us later, thank you for taking the time. This is extremely important to the system and uh, for the safety of our kids. So the purpose is really providing guidance. Uh, I don't think anybody, it, it's uncontroversial. I would hope that we need to protect minors um, from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, and this is really about providing guidance. What is a minor? A minor is any individual under 18. Um, and this policy provides information on reporting within the VSC and those requirements, as well as for, for folks for whom it applies, uh, the requirements for uh, under Vermont law. So I just realized that this is an old draft of the policy, but I think, sorry, hang on a sec. This is the challenge of working from home. Um, I think we'll, everything will be there and I will send out uh, the correct and entire policy. But so it's important to remember minors are present on our campuses um, as visitors, as community members. They're also present in classrooms um, as dual degree students, as matriculated students. Um, and, and so our, our employees, our staff and, and our students are interacting with minors. And, and that's why this policy becomes important. It's not just the summer camps happening on campus. Um, it's also the day to day, certainly for our CCV students. And, uh, and our VAS students. Oh, there we go. I didn't realize that was the way it was gonna go. So the most important in my mind uh, aspect of this is that all members of the community, which includes this body, are required to report if they have knowledge or reasonable suspicion um, 
about sexual abuse perpetrated against a minor by an adult affiliated with the VSCA. And that report would go probably for the board. It should come to the general counsel's office. Um, but it could also go to the Title IX or Policy 311 coordinator at each institution or to public safety at a given institution. And all of the contact information is provided in appendices to the policy. So what is a reasonable suspicion? Uh, it could be based on witnessing a single incident. It could be based on what a minor says. Um, it could be based on what an adult says about what has happened to a child. Uh, it could be an explanation for an injury that just doesn't track. Uh, or it could be a combination of multiple warning signs. And again, what's great about this policy is that uh, in one of the appendices, it's got some good materials just to recognize uh, what may signal an incident of abuse or, or a warning sign. So how do we implement it? Um, all members of the VSC community have to get this training. And uh, our former investigator, Susan Law, put together uh, what by many accounts was a fantastic training and pushed it out in a very short period of time training literally uh, hundreds of people um, on this policy last, uh, it must be this past spring, it seems like years ago, but I think it was probably February of 20, uh, 2020. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, as I, as I said before, everybody has a duty to internally report suspect, suspected cases. There are certain people who would be considered mandated reporters under Vermont law and the policy uh, mirrors the law by requiring those folks to report suspected child abuse to the Department for Children and Families within 24 hours. And, and those reports go to the Family Services Division. The, the policy itself has all the contact information. And as you'll see at the end of the presentation, we also have um, contact information on, on several different websites. What happens when a report comes in? Uh, they're handled by the Title IX coordinator they're, uh, or the Policy 311 coordinator. They would be handled by the General Counsel's Office. They would be handled by Public Safety. We would filter all of those, though, to the Policy 311 coordinator. And if it was warranted to investigate the alleged abuse, we would follow the existing procedures under Policy 311A, which is our sexual uh, assault uh, and related violations uh, policy. And I think this board is fairly familiar with what the requirements of that, those implementing procedures are, but it's a, a thorough investigative process um, and an impartial decision maker um, with opportunities for both the alleged abuser and the alleged victim um, to speak. As I said before, as part of this implementation, we also provide training for employees and volunteers. Um, and we also insist that third parties working with minors train their staff on Policy 316. And again, that's really focused on, on the folks who run summer camps on our campuses but are not direct employees of the VSC. Um, I really don't know where these animations are coming from, so I'm sorry about that if that's uh, <laughs> tripping people up. So this is just a quick slide to show information about how to contact the Family Services Division with DCF, um, how to uh, respond immediately in the case of, of urgent uh, or emergent situations, um, but also a reminder to our staff and, and to this body that even if you call law enforcement, uh, the obligation still applies for mandated reporters to notify the Family Services Division. So that very quickly uh, is policy 316, but I think what's really paramount about it is recognizing um, what is required of us as officers of the corporation. Um, and I would encourage you, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a moment, just in case there are questions, I would encourage you to take a, take a look at the policy itself, the resources attached to the policy. Um, I know members of this board are involved in lots of other nonprofits, other organizations, churches, uh, et cetera. And it, this is a really important area of growing awareness. And I, I commend very highly to you uh, looking both at our policy and other resources available out there. So I'll pause right there and ask if there are any questions, concerns, comments about policy 316, which again, I know the board passed just about six months ago. I would just echo what, what Todd said. I mean, attached to the policy and the, and the appendices to it are links um, to video resources and things like that to help people identify what might be suspected child abuse. Um, and again, it's not just for this 
you know, in this particular setting, it carries over, you know, if you have young kids in camps or whatever, I mean, it's just valuable information to have as a community member. So I would really encourage people to look through the materials that are there um, because there are some really helpful uh, resources uh, just to make sure everyone pays attention. I think the, the concern is that historically, people are aware something doesn't seem quite right, but they don't feel empowered to report it to anyone. And if only people had done that, you know, at Penn State or Michigan State, um, maybe the, the trauma and the, and the abuse that occurred would have been stopped much sooner and could have been addressed. But unfortunately, there were reports. Well, I accept it that still that's... Did, it still didn't. <laughs> right. Didn't. So but I think, I think you need to understand that. Right. But I think there's, you know, there are a lot of times where there are people just don't know who to report to or they're concerned about something, but they figure someone else will deal with it. So it's just something to be aware of. But Bill's right. Um, it, certainly, in, it appears that there were multiple reports that were made that were not addressed. But this is why, obviously, our insurance company wants to make sure everybody understands the importance of reporting and not sitting on reports and not moving them forward. If you are become aware of it, you need to just make sure you let people know uh, so something can be done and it can be addressed. And I think and at Penn State, since it was football program, Joe Paterno, he was known, nothing happens and is done in this, and under this program, I have total control over that. You can't let that be an attitude within an institution whether it's sports or some other program. And, and I think to Bill's point and, and somewhat to Linda's as well, uh, what I didn't highlight in that brief presentation is that the policy also provides that employees can be disciplined just for failure to report, uh, let alone failure to move an investigation forward. And that's part of the reason that the general counsel's office is involved is with the, uh, the hope, and I think certainly with the people who are in that office now, um, that we will provide that objective uh, commitment to the organization rather than a commitment to some element of the organization that ultimately, you know, <clears throat> I am your lawyer, I am responsible to you and you as fiduciaries, and that becomes the most important element. Jim? Yeah, thank you. Um, and there several parts to this. I mean, the one thing is in one is to do nothing. That was the olden days. The other is to stop whatever is happening in the instant and think that the job is done. But clearly that's not when the job is done. It has to be reported and it has to be looked through to use a common phrase because <clears throat> that's where the impact is in straightening things out. It has to be reported and it has to be dealt with. And and as far as, <clears throat> if I understand you, Todd, it, the whole thing talks about employees having this obligation, but in this case, the, the trustees are treated as if we were employees in terms of, I mean, right, in terms of the duty to respond and, and report. Right. Okay. Exactly. And is it on or off campus? Um, it is the involvement of the VSC, uh, an individual affiliated with the VSC, but and on and and occurring on our property as well for those third party camps. Yeah. Or how about anywhere on earth? No. no? You know, if, we, if, if an English professor is oh. coaching a little league team and we see something on the little league team completely away from school, completely away from teaching English? Are, are, we, are we reporters for off-campus, unrelated activity by a VSC employee? If in yeah. doubt, I would encourage you to report it. I mean, okay. we'd get into, there'd be other issues that would come up in terms of, was it related to their employment with us? I mean, there'd, there'd be a whole other legal issues, but I would just say, if in yeah. doubt, report it. If it's something we don't have jurisdiction over, maybe we can follow up with people that would have jurisdiction over it. But if you don't report it, nothing's going to happen. No, so I, I we're understand. on the side of reporting and we can, yeah. you know, address <laughs> it once we're aware of it. I was a mandated reporter and, for a long time. I, I, I understand yeah. that. And relatedly, if we have knowledge by you knowing that it happened and if the unfortunate circumstance occurs that that same individual abuses someone at the VSC, 
and we had foreknowledge and never reported it, you know, we've, we need <clears throat> to be careful in those circumstances. We need to be protecting people. Okay. Uh, uh, two questions. One, or a question and a comment. A question is, I I'm not clear whether you're, I mean, I've been a mandated reporter off and on for years as a person working in the mental health field, et cetera, and done trainings, et cetera. But I'm not clear that we as board of trustee members are quote mandated reporters. Were you saying that we were? I don't believe we're mandated reporters. No. no. So I think no. we just need, that doesn't no. mean we shouldn't report. You don't have to, well, you, you get to report even if you're not a mandated reporter and you have protections. That's a very, yeah, that's a very important distinction, Bill. Mandated reporters are defined under Vermont law and are yes. required to report incidents to the Department for Children and Families. Right. Policy 316 says everyone in the VSC community is required to report within the VSC. <laughs> so that's a report to the General Counsel's Office. That's a report right. to the Office of Public Safety. Right. That's a report to the Title IX 311A coordinator. Right. It is, it's a dual path, but you're absolutely right. Most of our employees are not mandated reporters. But they still have an obligation to report under yeah. this policy internally. Yeah. And when I said anywhere on earth, I was speaking without making the distinction between being a VSC trustee or employee or somewhere or just somewhere downtown Manchester or something like that. I mean, it, um, personally, I think I have an obligation <clears throat> to report to somebody. Yeah. Um, you get the point. Yeah. Uh, I, two other quick things. One is that uh, this is a re, this is a training around minors, where there's concern about sexual exploitation or abuse, right? Or neglect, yeah. Or neglect, right? This is. There are other situations which we should also be vigilant about Absolutely. where there are not minors involved, where we have adults on our campus. Most of the people on our campus are 18 or over, or many of them are. And right. that's, that's a whole nother level of importance. Just to mention, that's not, we're not saying, oh, you don't have any obligation there. And I, but I, think, I think for me, being a board of trustees member, a member of the board of trustees here, I think our most important obligation under this is to make sure that all of our staff understand that we will not support staff members looking the other way. That it's often a message from a the top leadership or the top board that says, we really don't want to know, better to not bring it to our attention. And that I think is a particular obligation we have as the board of trustees to make it clear that we will not count, we do not countenance that. And it, if we, if so, enough said. I would, I would just add that go. we do periodically do the trainings on, on policy 311 and 311A, which is the discrimination, harassment, uh, sexual assault, sexual misconduct policy. So, you know, Bill, you're absolutely correct. This is not, um, you know, this is not to say that we don't have other policies that apply right. to that. It's just, this is a, a, a new policy that we're required to make, you know, we, we're making every effort we can to make sure that everyone gets training on it. But we will certainly, I'm sure in September, which is when we usually do it, remind the board of trustees about the other trainings that we have um, that, that are important that are around these issues. And certainly again, we've got the Title IX regulations out there. We'll be revising policies and procedures. So, you know, you will be getting an education on those um, just inevitably coming up in the next few months. Do we need to sign something to verify that we've had this training for our insurer? No. Uh, we, we are, we will track it. Right. We, we, are, we, we represent, we, we are required to let our insurance company know that we have shared um, the information that's in the packet with you and that we have conducted trainings. Uh, thank you for all of those comments and questions uh, and for engaging with this. The other piece, uh, again, as I said, is a response to a request from the board uh, several months ago now to uh, learn a little bit more about fiduciary duty. And so I'm going to bring that presentation up now. Um, and I think the last time we had this training might have been in 2018, 
along with our conflict of interest training, but we do try and brush up on this every year. And I think it's important, um, especially with all the heavy fiduciary decisions going on right now with the board to talk a little bit about what are the specific legal fiduciary duties. Um, so fiduciary duty is a role of the board. It involves the duties of the board. And I think it's important here to talk really what is the role of the VSC board. As you are exercising uh, quite regularly this spring, it is oversight of the corporation, um, which of course includes um, budgetary matters, uh, personnel in the name of the president and chancellor, presidents and chancellor, um, and also overseeing the policies. The board also provides that leadership on governance at the system level, um, is accountable to the entire VSC and all of the members, member institutions, and I would argue to the state of Vermont. Um, and the board ultimately is the final authority on, on how the VSC operates. So I want to talk also about the principles of governance and what it means to be a governance officer. Board members, as discussed in that last training, are officers of the entire system and have a fiduciary responsibility to the entire system, not to a specific institution. The board is focused on developing that oversight through both policies and finances. Board, you know, is very heavily involved in our budget process. Uh, through committees often, but certainly the whole board as well, um, through the development of policy and, of course, through hiring executives, which is a main focus of the board at this time. It's also important that the board acts as an entire body, a body made up of 15 um, individuals, not as individuals themselves. As has often been stated um, by board chairs current and past, uh, members express views and advocate for change within the board structure and not as individuals outside the board structure. It is vital as a board member to be open and to build trust and honesty both as a body and within the body. I just like this quote um, from the AGB. A fiduciary is someone who has special responsibilities in connection with the administration investment, monitoring, and distribution of property, meaning the public assets of the institution, as well as the intangible assets, such as its reputation and role in the community. And it's really those last pieces, right, that it is vitally important that the board focus not only on the bricks and mortar and the dollars and cents, but also uh, the goodwill that we have built through 60, since 1961, I guess it's been about 60 years, uh, and continue to build. So as a lawyer, I am uh, required at least once in every presentation to use the section symbol you see there uh, before 830. So I've done that now, just want that noted. Um, there are two core legal duties, the duty of care, which is about being reasonable and diligent in your work. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation and the duty of loyalty. And we'll talk more about that uh, at the full presentation in September. Um, you know, it's, if you haven't seen this presentation before, haven't served on many boards, things like obedience sound somewhat strange and archaic, but uh, the realities of the duty of loyalty are that you are operating in good faith, that you hold the, the needs and values of the corporation, in this case, the VSC at the highest level, um, and, and follow the decisions of the board, um, and that you avoid conflict of interest. But as I say, I'm gonna focus mostly here on the duty of care. It's just another quote about what those two duties mean. Good faith decisions in the best interest of the institution, consistent with the mission. So the duty of care under Vermont law and Vermont follows, uh, uh, Vermont law is very similar to most states. The duty of care requires that you act with the care an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would act under similar circumstances. In brief, that means you act reasonably as a board member in responding to the situation that comes before you. So exercising ordinary care is important here. Asking the challenging questions that the board asks, uh, probing for further information, ensuring that you have 
a full understanding of what's going on. That requires diligence. It requires reading the materials. Um, and it's also really important, and, and I, I flag this one as well, that the board can rely on the information, opinions, reports, the, the data you get from the chancellor, the CFO, the general counsel, uh, the controller, whatever officers or presidents, deans of administration come before the board, as long as you don't know that the information is wrong or have reason to believe that it would be incorrect, um, it is entirely appropriate for the board to rely on that information in making its decision. And so if you're relying reasonably, you've been diligent, and you make a decision, you are appropriately exercising your duty of care. So again, it's about being informed. It's about engaging and participating in the conversation. And it's about committing as I believe this board has done to a degree I have rarely seen with boards, uh, just in terms of participation over the last three months, um, committing to ensuring the long-term health and well-being of the state college system. So again, short and hopefully largely to the point, I wanna stop and, and see if there are questions. And as I said, uh, I didn't delve into the duty of loyalty, obedience and the like, um, or conflicts of interest, but was mostly responding to a request to talk a little bit about fiduciary duties. But you're saying I will learn about whether or not I can demand obedience later. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I will not opine on that, especially as a new dog owner. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one part of my life where I can demand it. <laughs> <laughs> Interested to learn where that is. <laughs> yeah, really. I wish. <laughs> So I got the door closed because they can't find me in here. Uh -huh. I don't think it says a dog owner. <laughs> no. Thoughts and questions for Todd on his thoughtful presentation to us. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Be reminded. You're most welcome. We, we must behave as ordinary to discuss people. Some behave. of this when we're more fresh at another time. Yes. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed. When it's not 98 degrees inside your house. That's right. It is. It's okay. always. Okay. Thank you. Sophie, what else do you have for us? I think that's it. Just a motion to adjourn. Fantastic. Hey. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. And a second? Second. second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 We are Aye. adjourned. Thank you one and all. Stay tuned. Aye. Nice to see you. Thank you all. Bye, Bye all.